Mm, that sound is so welcoming. <laughs> Scott, I can't see you at the moment. Um, mm. I can just see the word Scott. And now I can see you. Hey. Hey. Out of quarantine. Yes. Sorry to, sorry to have kept you. Um, right, I've happy. been reading about Jack Wilshire because he's a oh. Bournemouth player now, isn't it? Didn't he score on his debut? Yeah. yeah, he scored. Really. That was in the in the cup, and then he scored yesterday in the in the championship. A born doing okay because you've got like this dual allegiance in the championship at the moment. Yeah, yeah, we're not. Uh, no, we were doing all right at the start, and then yeah, we lost like six games in a row or something, and now we're not doing all right. But we won yesterday. Not sacked bad. the manager. Get rid of him. Another manager sacked. Yeah. Oh my God, Eddie Howe is just like crying in a dark room right now, pining. Exactly. They're pining. kind of saying that they might get him back, but that just seems way too soon. That seems a bit mad to me. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, he's like Bournemouth DNA, isn't he? So yeah, yeah. I guess like, you know, they're, they're missing their Eddie. Um, mm. And Norwich at the moment, um, that's, that's where you are. Are you... Um, flying the Norwich flag, wearing the, the Norwich jersey with pride at the moment. They're flying right now. and I've never really had a nice jersey that I'd like to just wear, you know, so... <laughs> loud, it's loud as fuck, but... Yeah, yeah, exactly. But no, I did, I did think that that might happen, but it didn't. I kind of... I follow a little bit, but not really. They're enemies, aren't they? They're, they're top of the league. Yeah, I mean... So, I mean, there's there's a huge um, Anglia rivalry in terms of like, um, you know, the football teams, um, but there's not really too much to get um, excited about in the kind of formal like sporting world. So no. there's quite a lot of like football kind of going on at the moment, really yeah, yeah, exactly. like the only thing that's actually going on in the world. But you did say um, just before we uh, got on air that you were watching... Um, the do the thing diary cj wellsmore yeah yeah it's the um, first one i've watched actually i just saw it on bmag is that like um is that a vlog that cj is doing yeah yeah he's just on like a mega ramp just like hung over doing the thing he's just doing like <laughs> 720 corkscrews being like it's the perfect hangover cure man it's like pfft, don't know about that i wonder how long he's going to be able to to stick to that sort of tagline because he's quite well known for um being worse for wear um, yeah. the morning of, you know, performing or, or skating, like, you know, yeah, you know, that's me. ramps and, and so on and so forth. But does it get like, um, you know, when you see people in other parts of the world um, being able to do the thing right now in the kind of midst of uh, coronavirus, like, is that uh, a cord of jealousy or, or envy yeah, for you? Yeah, I mean, there's layers as well, because I'm watching him, like, I guess, and he's in Australia. I'm not sure where he is. Wherever it is, it's well hot. And he's, like, on a mega ramp, skating with mates, no masks on or anything. And I'm sat at home, and there's a blizzard outside. It's actually snowing right now here. Yeah, we got that, too. I can... It's very <laughs> wonderland outside yeah. in Beeford. So it's like, even if we were allowed to go outside and hang out together, it'd be in the cold and snow. So well, they get the opposite season, don't they? Yeah. Um, down in the Australasian part of the world. So we're always going to get that jealousy, I suppose, regardless of coronavirus. But it's, yeah. um, I think, like the recent, um, like New Zealand kind of saying, we're like literally fine, basically. Yeah. Um, and then I think you get like these little um snippets or glimpses of where the world is actually like still functioning in like old terms which is yeah. now like a year ago basically old yeah. world was a year ago um i think um you know like florida in the united states for instance they like yeah. zero bucks and just yeah. doing whatever you know they want to do and uh, just can't believe it's been a year like when it first happened it was like oh we might like be locked down for like three weeks <laughs> It's a weird one, isn't it? Like that that sense of, um, you know, like perspective um, on, you know, these sort of significant periods of time. Yeah. Um, but seem like uh, within like a year, it's like, you know, so many um, experiences, travels, places, meetings, you know, so much yeah. that can happen, you know, in a year. And um, we've been forced to kind of take a really long road the last 12 months you know time mm. sort of slowed down significantly is that what you know is that your 
is that your experience of things like in the life? Yeah, I think so. I kind of, I do feel a little bit lucky though, in terms of, I mean, I'm not old, but I'm glad that I'm not like, you know, like 17, 18 or 16 kind of age. And this is happening. Like, I feel like that's a bit different. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like someone that's like trying to start, I don't know, finishing school and starting the next journey or whatever. And it's just like, they are locked down or whatever. Like, or maybe they're not because they're, they're younger, aren't they? But like the world is locked down. It's definitely a had a um, pause. Yeah, no, that's right. Um, and I suppose the kind of pause in a journey at that period, that stage of life is, is a massive, massive deal. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, you and I can, take a degree of perspective about what's happening and, and sort of hunker down although you know like we're we're sort of bursting to get going in yeah. the place that we previously were whereas like you know younger people it's it's way more developmental and and sort of you know necessary to continue on you know with their kind of building of like perspective yeah. and building of what my journey is and what I'm doing you work with I mean, but you don't work with, you, you work with young people, right? Um, yeah, I guess they start, like, the youngest would probably be 18, I guess. 18 to, I don't know, up until, what, like, old. Like, we get, like, mature students that start doing a degree at, like, 60. And so, that's at the University of... Of the Arts in Norwich, yeah. University of the Arts in Norwich. So you've got um, students coming out of college um, or um, mature students who are looking to, you know, commence or resume kind yeah. of studies. Okay, and it's a yeah, specific most, most will be like just coming out of like sick form or college or whatever, most will be that age, but there are, you know, there's a fairly big percentage of mature students too. Usually fine art is the mature students. What's the, the sort of, um, you know differentiation between like kind of fine art i mean i hear fine art as a academic course um quite often um and i believe ben woodcock did fine art at university as well right or I think did he not he did illustration but he is kind of more of a fine art illustrator i'd say probably what's the the sort of fine art like vibe is that something that you see having like a future at this point in time given does it change um, those sorts of courses in in the arts this sort of situation Mm, I'm not sure because I'm not too I mean I studied graphic design and I'm kind of into video stuff so fine art isn't really in my lane anyway but um fine art is just like wholly more conceptual like super I don't know I feel like the the mature students that do fine art they're kind of they're not trying to go down a career route they just want to study it and they kind of want to have those conversations with like-minded people I guess so doing a course in that that age is is right but I mean the younger people that are doing it, I guess they're seeking a career in it and I don't know yeah I don't know how that will change we we're talking about because we've got a gallery there as well that we get like kind of guest artists in and stuff like that and they were talking about the next exhibition that they're doing like actually building it and then just like filming it for like a virtual experience of it so like you could do it in like there's other galleries that have been doing like website versions of the exhibition but they were actually saying about continuous like continuing to build it like spending the same amount of money as they would but having no one in there and just like filming the route around it i guess which i don't know i don't know how i feel about any of that just experiencing art that way just i don't know depends on the art i guess i suppose there's you know it's a kind of innovation by necessity um i guess to keep like the awareness and the connection with the sort of work going and to observe it i suppose and to view it is still like you know possible although it's like laptops and you know sort of what we're doing right now type thing and yeah i suppose a lot of the students are doing learning virtually with yourself at the moment rather than a sort of face-to-face contact so like even the way that you work has changed massively you're like a technician right so you're in the class you'd be in the classroom kind of um supporting guiding students with their with their like work how how do you exactly so it'll be it'll be like where i am now my newer job um it's kind of all students i'm in an area where like any kind any course student can come in and kind of ask for our help if they want help with anything but um 
it's mostly because we're, we're called the design studio so it's mostly like graphic design students and illustration students fashion I guess if they're trying to make books and booklets and those kind of things like animation film like anything like that yeah but it, I mean it's it's very tricky helping people like remotely it's just it's not the same at all yeah um, so you, you would want to be sort of exchanging ideas like with somebody with things tangible in front of you laid exactly, out yeah. type thing and mm -hmm. so it's been tricky to to you know provide the, that yeah support, especially but... things like print design because that's like a big thing obviously like editorial print design that the the students because we can't really print stuff for them even though we have kind of made that a thing now that we they can print and we can send it to them which is that's whatever but um yeah them not being asked to design something that would be viewed as print but be able to see on the screen but their 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 course is designed for print you yeah. know what i mean and like that's mm -hmm. a very very different thing that holding something in your hand and like designing it as the person's going to be doing this rather than yeah i don't know i i, I don't know how much impact that's going to have on their career and whatever but i don't know well yeah that that's a, a really um important point i suppose like the 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 modality um of how you take it you know like print you know you feel it mm -hmm. um it's in your hands i suppose like the texture and the thickness you know the type of card or paper or, or material that's used the typeface the font mm -hmm. quality of the print itself the ink the way yeah. that there are imperfections i suppose like in you know i suppose all of these things that are about touching about that, yeah, that exactly. faculty of touch and, and feeling it, you know, um, and that's changed that the way it's, you know, delivered, I suppose, for the students, sure. like, you know, virtual online stuff is going to be very different. Well, so you're, so you're at the University um, of Arts in Norwich at the moment. How, how long have you been in Norwich now working at, at the uni? Uh... Because you, you were at Bournemouth Uni before, right? Yeah, yeah, the Arts University of Bournemouth. They're very similar institutes, actually. It's kind of lucky that the two, those two places have an arts uni. They, they both also have, like, a, a main uni, which is mm. not the same. And then the arts uni, which is, like, much smaller, but still fairly big considering it's just an arts uni. Um, but I've been here, I think, nearly two years now. Um, or no, one and a half, one and a half years. And you and you transferred um, from Bournemouth and Bournemouth is so, I mean, just to kind of think about um, sort of sta stages from earlier on in your life. Um, and thanks for sharing stuff about your like current work situation. I mean, I suppose like, you know, we're all like locked down, hunkered down at the moment. So the immediate changes are the things that are kind of prevalent in your yeah, mind. Yeah. And I've got to go back to work tomorrow with continuously sort of dealing with some of those changes yeah um, but I was curious about you know some of the things you know maybe um, earlier on in life and did you were you born and, and raised in Bournemouth like what was your upbringing no, so I'm from Weymouth which is like 45 minutes from Bournemouth like right. more west um, and that's where Conair and Harry are from as well, which is how I know those two. Um, but during the making, like just shortly after we started making D the first DRC video, me and Harry both moved to Bournemouth. Um, I managed to get the job at the uni before I moved, which was actually like a really big, because at the time I was working with my dad as a roofer and like really struggling to find like a design type job and then that job came up and I got it and then I moved there Harry moved with the idea that we were making the video but also didn't really have a job lined up he was just like yeah I'm down I'm down to get out of way if I'm down to like which is wicked actually looking back at it because I don't know if I would have made that same kind of like I don't know commitment and a bit of a risk I guess and then he managed to get a job while we were living there so that just kind of worked out but yeah I'm not from Bournemouth but it's only 40 minutes away my sister lives there now so my parents and my sister like are there most of the time so it's kind of it's kind of home if I was to go back home I'd probably go back to Bournemouth more than I would to Weymouth okay but they're they're fairly close by on the, the south coast of the yeah. United Kingdom so your like earlier childhood up to I suppose your um mid-teens was basically like Weymouth oriented like what yeah yeah 
what what's growing up in like a seaside town like Weymouth like you know what 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 are the sort of impressions of of your childhood Weymouth is like a kind of smaller cheesier version of Bournemouth if you if you've ever been to Bournemouth it's like a it's a bit of a cheesy seaside town but it's still it's a little bit like it's quite, it's quite a lot of bro mentality you know like the mm-hmm. clubs and like the stag do's that happen there kind of like it's like the bad side of Brighton without like the other bit of it if that makes mm-hmm. sense yeah <laughs> It's like a smaller, definitely more like confined version. Like a lot of people grow up in Weymouth and don't really leave, but it's quite a small seaside town, like right on like the peninsula where there's like Portland as well. You said you've been mm. there before as well, right? Which is an even weirder, like micro place. Because I, I mean, I know of Portland Bill and I, I obviously yeah. know of the um, the skate park that you guys have skate there, but I've never actually been to Portland. I just sort of... I've just sort of know of these of these places mainly yeah. from um, you know like videos um, of that mm-hmm. particular skate park. But I think I trained um, at uni when I was at uni. I trained with somebody from Portland, Bill. Right? Yeah. So that was just a, it was just in my mind actually. Anyway, is that this yeah. is like sort of island? I mean, that's crazy place. if they're from Portland, Bill. Because I mean, Portland is like off of Weymouth, and like I already said, Weymouth's like quite like a micro. Like if you a lot of people don't leave, and it's like. It's very like I don't even know how to explain it. It's a bit Jeremy Kyle, you know, like some of those kind of places, and like everybody knows everyone kind of situation. But then if you live on Portland, that's even more like it's an it's actually an island. There's like one road that joins mm. it to like the mainland, I guess. And if you live on the Bill, which is like all the way like to the far end, it's just like rocky. It's like the main part of the Jurassic Coast, which is like it's just rocks and a lighthouse essentially. Just mad Jurassic. Yeah, I used to spend a lot of time there, like cliff jumping, because that's all it is. It's not even like beachy island. It's like rocky, serious. Cl- cliff jumping just gives me the um, gives me the chills. To be honest, um, <laughs> I've I, I have seen some like really terrifying kind of videos of cliff jumping. Um, yeah. I mean, I think we all have. You know, the internet's like riddled with uh, risk <laughs> risk taking behaviour. Yeah. Um, what so before was that the first type of risk stuff that you would have been doing is jumping off of rocks and and stuff like that no I don't think so I was into like BMXing there was a BMX track kind of near where I lived like between rollerblade and BMX in I guess a bit of skateboarding I must have done at some point and then okay. yeah like my summers were kind of like getting the bus to Portland Bill and going cliff jumping then coming back and going to the bike track on my BMX like that's kind of what I would do wow it sounds like a triathlon <laughs> yeah like <laughs> that sounds like some uh you know some you know psychological physical kind of training because you know great heights uh, i mean i've seen people launch themselves are we talking about cliffs here or or like rocks what 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 sort of thing are we talking? i mean are you plummeting free falling there's a lot of like different levels and stuff but there are some like big cliffs for sure which have you jumped off some big yeah I, I, I love it I, I loved it when i was a kid my dad used to take me my irresponsible father used to like take he used to take me and my mates there when we were like 14 he just drive us there and then watch us jump he'd watch yeah <laughs> which is quite God. mad now because it like say i go back to weymouth i'm like i want to go cliff jumping or whatever my parents would be like oh please don't go it's so dangerous i'd be like you used to take me there you used to drive me there and actively like where was your was your mum like a a sort of a countering voice for yeah, that, she that never trip that to the it. cliffs? Never that into it. She was always well supportive, but like of anything that I did, I guess. But she she wasn't psyched about me jumping off cliffs, not really. And so you know, like in terms of your your dad's, um, you know, wanting to take you to the cliffs to kind of get it out your system, or what? I mean, what? Because that that's really fascinating. Because you know, being into sports, that's one thing, and there is an inherent risk with sports. I mean, we've all been injured countless times doing various different sports and stuff. I suppose like diving or like base jumping, kind of is a sport. Diving definitely is like a formal, like yeah. Olympic sport. Like you know, the form that one takes, you know, at the different stages of the dive, the entry point, all of that mm-hmm. sort of stuff. Um, but I don't suppose that's really much of a thought at that stage of things. So you're more like, what, 
you're more like let's go to the cliffs and just jump you know your dad for your dad to to be yeah. saying let's go and do that that's that's very um extreme position for a parent to take what, yeah. what did he jump off of cliffs similarly he, he jumped off a ferry bridge which is the bridge that kind of joins weymouth to portland and there's like a bridge in the middle and what's hilarious about that bridge is there's a really strong current that goes underneath it so you kind of jump off of one side and by the time you come up out of the water you're kind of on the other side of the bridge is if like it's a bit disorientating at first when you first do it but like that's just how it is and you kind of ride it kind of out to where you need to get out and my dad jumped there one time after us being like are you scared like because my dad's definitely one he's a roofer so he's like used to be like mr macho like you've got a boys don't cry kind of attitude you know right now i know now i'm older and i know him much better he is not that guy at all it's just, it was all a facade for sure There's a bit of a front there with with dad yeah, and so he do you think he wanted to um like instill something in yeah, you by those sorts sure. of 100 percent. what do you think yeah. that you know, like, he also wants to go like on the building site and tell his mates like my boy jumps off the cliffs he does like flips off the cliffs you know like he wants that like, that's what he wants so yeah I think that's what happened there but he's also must have been terrified in his mind for sure because he's thinking I hope Scott doesn't get swallowed by a current yeah or... <laughs> what, irresponsible like... though taking other other people's kids as well and then there's the whole like you know because you know I, I do I do my bits and pieces of work with kids as well and you know this whole uh, you know idea of consent is like pretty important yeah. in just across the board so definitely when it comes to looking after other young people other kids you sort of want um, a thumbs up from the parent basically mm -hmm. as to what's happening and that's usually something not like cliff jumping yeah um, that's it. so at what's what age was sort of that kind of cliff jumping rock jumping bmxing dipping your toes into this kind of like um... that would have been like 13 to like i guess like i would still go cliff jumping now they never really stopped it just kind of slowed down but um that like bmxing and stuff like that stopped when i found blading i guess which was probably can't really remember the exact age that that was but i think it was like 99 2000 okay so you're yeah i mean that that so i that, think i started skating around 15 i think okay so that's like a pretty is that late or an average time to start skating i mean i suppose it's relative to how old you are i guess yeah but... i mean i did actually do a bit of blading i remember me and a couple of mates and my sister actually like skating and me wanting a pair of k2 I can't remember what they were. Maybe it was fatties at the time. Fatties. I can't remember. But I remember that being a thing and people saying like around me, people saying that's the skates that you need to get. And I did that for like, I don't know, maybe a summer. And then like a couple of years later, I actually picked it up properly. But I like I did skate earlier and I just didn't, I, I guess I just didn't like, I don't know, I just didn't stick with it. And then I had a go, when I did actually start skating, I had to go on a mate's pair of skates and we were like at a set of stairs and I just like jumped these set of stairs and then did a 360 and was like, this is wicked. Ah. Like, this is for me, for sure. So and that's, I all right. Uh, definitely, um, I had a, you know, like a eureka moment. So like in what way did inline skating kind of like take up precedence in your mind? Um, were you exposed to it um, or tempted into trying it out specifically inline? I mean, you know, wheeled, stuff comes to our awareness i suppose um it's quite prevalent but in what way did, did skating take up residence in in your mind like that eureka kind of thing i don't know i think i had some like natural ability which is always appealing to me i guess i'm quite competitive a lot of my mates said i'm well competitive I, I, i'd like to say that i'm not but i guess i am like sam you definitely if people very... are saying you are you are <laughs> yeah <laughs> so like just being able to put on a pair of skates and like okay i've got like i can do stuff already do you know what i mean like i don't know if it would have been the same if i got on the skateboard and it's like oh look i can just jump down the set of stairs i think that was massively appealing that i can just get started and do tricks like straight away i think that was really good um and anybody that's ever been good at something like blading are lying if they didn't say that they like to show off to people so being able to put on a pair of skates like showing someone that i can 360 down the spare set of stairs was obviously appealing i think so yeah it just completely took over from there. After that, and I had to go on a mate's pair of skates, I bought some Vertex off of someone else. 
Oh. Um, and then there was a half pipe. This is a time that there wasn't really skate parks everywhere. So then we went to a town, like the next town on, which was like a 20 minute bus journey to like a half pipe that was just in the middle of a field. And from that point on, like it was, it was on basically, because it was just dropped in the six foot, dropped in the eight foot. And that was just it. There was just everything to learn. So you're kind of, I mean, that was all my time then thinking about it and doing it. It was just like. So, yeah, I, I can totally um, like resonate with sort of being oriented around like a ramp, like a specific ramp. And, and that's kind of how, um, you know, I sort of accelerated things and, and got going. There was a, a local ramp to where I lived. Did you, were you frequenting this ramp with certain people? Were you going mm -hmm. on your own? Did it get like so exciting and overwhelming that you were sort of there getting lifts on your own kind of thing? And how did, how I've did never it go? Went, I've, like, I've never been someone to skate on my own, actually. So I never went there on my own, but it would be the same people. We'd go there, there was like two, three of us at times. It would just go to the half pipe and learn stuff i remember learning like heart like i didn't have anything to like base anything on either i don't think i don't i didn't have any videos or magazines or anything at that point i was just like learning to do like handstand flips and all sorts just oh you are doing the handstands yeah i got the handstand flips <laughs> eventually i learned to do a misty flip on that ramp like a fakie misty flip because i learned like handstand flips and there was just one where i was like i'm gonna do a no-handed handstand flip okay, <laughs> hey. up it. looking back at it it was like a bio i guess kind of like and you didn't have um, any um, external like impetus in terms of you. You just said videos, media content, magazines. This was scarce for you. At yeah, this not time. at that point. I don't think. Not for not for at least a year after I started. I wouldn't say that I had. So like ninety nine to two thousand kind yeah. of thing. I mean, there was enough out there. It's just I was being completely blind to it. Obviously. So just to kind of go back, uh, just to understand the sort of first exposure to inline skates, like, so I suppose, how did you know it was a thing, right? Like, if you're good at yeah. it, you're good at it, cool. And it, I think it's self-evidently pretty fun to look at. And I, we know this and we'll, we'll get into the all of the reasons how and why. But at that time, um, how did you know it was a thing that you wanted to be attached to? that you yeah. um that it was a thing to be like seen as cool or yeah i think that um being from a seaside town i'm pretty sure that team extreme frequented our like seafront and i right. think i remember going to see them did you want to explain what team extreme are team extreme were are they still about i guess they I are do yeah, you Aldridge. think it's still a thing and i think um you have Douglas Peel Yates, yeah. right? Guy Crawford um, at the time. Guy Crawford. Adam um, Davidson, possibly. Possibly. I remember but, someone, a kid doing a backflip, and I feel like that was Adam Davidson for some reason. But they are like an extreme organize, an extreme sport. Yeah, organization. Kind of like a version of like nitro, nitro circus, I guess. At that point, like they they would have a half pipe. I don't know if it was a vert ramp. I feel like it was maybe like between a vert ramp and a half pipe, and they would just like do runs and entertain with skating bmxing skateboarding possibly snakeboarding as well i feel like was in there at that point all right yeah um that makes sense um there's a re there's a really amazing snakeboarder from our area he's yeah. like one of the best snakeboarders in the world but you just so seldom see like snakeboarders um, um it's quite strange for an inline skater to consider another discipline this kind yeah. of like waning activity that is sort of on the edges of existence yeah you know. it's possibly more popular the blading is I don't know. <laughs> well yeah i mean i think we probably know by now uh you know the way that um information comes to us about the mm. these sorts of these sorts of activities but um it was just sort of uh we sort of i suppose we're talking about the model of like demos right yeah yeah it was a demo team it was a, it was a demo team so you would have seen some flip action yeah i saw some flip action some grinding some stalling on the back barrier wow you know what's big at those times i didn't learn this... to grind for a long time starting skating like that wasn't in my that wasn't in my understanding of blading i'll go to the half pipe i'd learn to stall i learned to like 540 the ramp and like do some flips and stuff i wasn't grinding for ages interesting 
so one definitely one of my first sort of intuitions or attachments to skating was the the principle of like the slide or the grinding yeah. and I suppose the you know the understanding of like the h block or the soul space as a sort of stall like allowing you to stall um I suppose that that I, I'm trying to remember if that sort of came after whether I was just so like um obsessed with the idea of grinding that I, I'm pretty sure I was trying to to do grinds or emulate grinding almost immediately for mm. you um you were just um you, you hadn't really taken on much skate media so when did you understand that grinding was a thing was that natural in terms of your use of the equipment and that it was possible with those spaces or you'd basically seen grinding and you were biding your yeah time i mean like I, I definitely didn't like invent grinding in my own, <laughs> um, in my own like, that's, kind of, that's what i was asking yeah that Did would you be amazing skating? imagine that i just like learned all these tricks and then found mainstream blade and was like ah <laughs> oh, there's other people doing it wicked the same tricks that i've named completely different you basically filmed a vod in like 99 <laughs> yeah. before it was a thing yeah, no, there were other people that skated. I mean, that was when skating was fairly big, wasn't it? So there's other people in my town skating. So I definitely did see it at some points. But mainly when I would go to like, I remember I then started getting the train to pool, which is like next to Bournemouth. And there's a skate park there. And there was a lot of bladers hanging out in there. So then as soon as I started going a little bit further than my own little town and stuff, I saw things and was like, oh, right, OK, this, this is what you can do. I mean, I remember... The first time that I went to, or one of the first times I went to Pool Skate Park, it's called Beta Skate Park. Dan Loveless was there. Mm -hmm. So he's from Pool mm -hmm. and he was there skating. And I remember being like, wow, like his dad, I think his dad owned Pool Skate Shop, which is like a really big skate shop at the time. Okay. And I remember him having like, maybe he had some like Cyrus on. He definitely had some like USDs and he had like Senate jeans on. And I remember being like, this guy is like, Swaggy. got it all. Like, Swaggy. he's. And he was good as well because he'd been skating that park and like I remember being he's like, an, he's wow. an amazing skater. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean he yeah. still is. Yeah. It's his yeah. beta skate park was definitely his like foundation of how good he is now. For sure. Which is interesting. It was just interesting, like going there and being like, right, like I don't feel like looking back on it now, I remember being like competitive again, being like, that's that's where I need to, that's what I want to be doing. And I don't think I was far off because I was comfortable on skates. I just didn't understand really what was going on. So I was like, oh, that's, that's what I need to be doing for sure. And then Weymouth Skate Park opened shortly after that. And then that was like a whole nother like massive chapter of my life because then people like Henry Johnson and stuff were working there. Mm -hmm. So that like I had a massive explosion and exposure to like what skating was and what was actually cool in skating. Because up until that point, I was like consuming everything, even stuff that, I don't know, I, I would consider now as like not being cool and not stuff that I wanted to do, but I was just like taking it all in and being like, I'm going to do all the tricks. So you're a lot more open at that point um, to how skating is being practiced and, you know, how it's being performed. And I suppose like you're building your like ideas around what's cool and what works for you. And yeah. Um, yeah, definitely a lot of that um, inspiration came from videos and magazines but actually being um in around older um skaters was certainly a thing oh, for nice. me that that played a part because it wasn't maybe it was about them being older and being sort of closer to like being a man and mm -hmm. it's you know it's, it's interesting that the skate park was called beta skate park because it makes me think of <laughs> alpha male right yeah. um but just that there's that like kind of um that drive to to kind of be a kind of older more robust respectable cooler type of uh boy or person and, yeah, and skating yeah. seems to um you know allow for that in a way is that is that does that yeah yeah can no, you I reflect is, does yeah, that make sense makes sense yeah for sure it was interesting as well because that was my route was like um Dorchester Halfpipe, Pool Skate Park, and then Weymouth Skate Park when that opened. And I frequented that like, that was me basically all day, every day, as much as I possibly could, I'd be there. And then for the first, like, I was, I was probably like a year or half a year at least until I met Harry at the skate park. And he, his route 
to that point of skating was very very different he was just skating street like i, I did skate street at some points like, i would like grind benches and stuff i mm. guess but like not it was more like while i was waiting for the skate park to open i'll be then like grinding a bench or something do you know what i mean it wasn't like i wouldn't go out to street skate necessarily as much but when i met harry he had just been like been ripping up the streets like watching words and like yeah skating so we, like that so we've sort of gone straight into to sort of mind game territory which you know <laughs> is a kind of explosion in your mind um you know like unto itself really um and the way that that made you feel and want to be out in the streets not like kind of hemmed in mm. by the the skate park set up uh, so just to sort of um remain in that area of your age just for just for a bit so sk skaters seem to be attracted to skating for reasons outside of the, the physical and mental kind of enjoyment of the act itself is it valid to consider skating a venue for for that rooting around for identity and belonging um you know is skating a path to assimilating with like culture at that time with mainstream yeah. culture yeah for sure because i guess um i was into football and stuff like i was well into that kind of thing and as soon as i found blading i like i quit football which is funny now looking back on it because you don't need to do one or the other obviously but like it was so strong in my mind that it's like i don't have time for this other thing like and also i think that it was kind of letting go of that kind of aesthetic of like sport guy and I was moving on to like, I don't know, listening to the type of music that I listened to and dressing the way I did. It's like, it wasn't fitting in with those football mates. So I was like, I am fully in on this blade in skate park scenario. Like this is what I'm doing, which is, yeah, it makes complete sense now. Did you like, when you were playing football, was the, the kind of future path kind of, um, did it, was it sort of a dead end, like in terms of like life and football and sport and being this kind of person? Did you, did you, or was it just a distasteful path just in terms um, of the company and the prospects? And Yeah, I think I was just doing it because that's what I did as well with football. Like if I look back on it now, I didn't really enjoy training that much because I don't know, I, I guess the people I wasn't that into either, because looking back on it now, they weren't my type of people. And then I wasn't, I didn't really look forward to games because I just, I didn't enjoy the pressure that much at the time and was like, wasn't, I did enjoy football, I guess, but I just didn't, I didn't care enough, like at all. Like, I'd love to play football now for a team like that and like actually train hard and be like, we're going to like, but I didn't, I just didn't care at all because I was thinking about foot, uh, skating and I was thinking about other stuff. I just didn't, so it's good that I stopped when I did because I was only doing it because that's what I had done up until that point. My dad was well into it as well. He was one of those dads that was like, he was like one of the coaches for the team and that kind of stuff. So I kind of, I guess, looking back on it as well, I definitely longed that out for probably a year longer than I needed to because I, I just didn't care for that last year. And I remember when I stopped as well, I wrote a letter to, not to my dad, obviously, but like I felt bad for the other manager because he was one of my dad's mates. And I remember writing a letter being like, I'm stopping for this reason. I felt really bad. Like I, like it, like I was Ronaldo and they're going to really miss me on the team <laughs> or whatever. And then he was like, yeah, cool. Like, I remember being like feeling quite free, but I remember being worried that I was going to like, it was going to upset my dad a bit because he'd be like, ah, oh. but he just didn't care. He still carried on coaching the team and was like, yeah, I care. That's, that's really funny. Um, again it, it's sort of like uh something that i can relate to in a sense that i i did essentially quit um all sport uh, yeah. i was like pretty sporty like I, I played football like i properly played football as a kid and like i played tennis for a bit i was like rooting around a little bit um but essentially um when i found skating you know i just sort of almost had to make a decision that you know mm. you sort of built up yeah. at that time that's really um interesting that you 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 needed to formalize the transition yeah. with a with a letter yeah it's um, like a divorce and, yeah and and i think in in some ways that's a pretty appropriate um gesture you know <laughs> i mean it's probably down to your your character and kind of like doing things properly anyway that is a pretty decent way yeah of, i think uh, my mum might have said it as well she's like oh for paul you're probably gonna like want to let him know probably like, i'm definitely not ringing him i'll write him a letter <laughs> <laughs> yeah ringing him would have been terrifying so um 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 
um um yeah i don't want to play anymore i don't want to play football anymore i want to do Michael. skating that's cool because we were just crowbarring you in the team anyway because you're billy's son like <laughs> <laughs> that's probably well, the case were you a starter um you i must, was a starter you must have I been mean, Looking back on it, I definitely could have been way better than I was. I just, I just didn't under, I didn't care enough about football to like understand the game. Yeah. Like watching it now, I love like the tactics and stuff like that. And I was, uh, I was a centre back, which would make sense now because I'm well tall, but I wasn't well tall at the time. I was yeah. little for my age at the time, so that it doesn't make sense. But I guess it was because I was brought up with my dad's mentality of like being tough. So being like the last man. I wasn't letting anyone pass me, even mm. if I was getting a boot in the face. Do you know what I mean? Mm. It was like, that was definitely part of my character at that point in time. So, yeah, I was a starter, but I definitely definitely wasn't fulfilling my potential, I wouldn't say. <laughs> so um, your dad imbued in you this sort of last man mentality. Yeah. Taking you cliff jumping, throwing you off cliffs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, your dad sounds amazing. He sounds like he needs a, a podcast uh, to get oh to the bottom God, of it. Oh my God, don't get on the podcast. It'd be embarrassing. He's amazing though. My dad is like, he's wicked. Like all of my mates, like I, I've called him Billy from when I was very, very young because he's more of a mate than he is a dad. Not saying that he's not a bad dad, but yeah. like irresponsible. Like it's definitely more like having a mate around than it is a dad. Like he used to take, yeah, he used to take me and my mates to like, like before like drop, we could drive or whatever to like, anywhere we wanted like he was down do you know what i mean he, he, he would drive you to like to like gigs and things and just like you know when we were super young and definitely if he asked the parents of the other kids if they wanted to go or if they would allow them to go they'd probably be like no <laughs> and i mean that's it yeah i mean that seems to uh have worked quite nicely um mm. for you uh, for you i suppose and you know how we're raised and those different values and the things that our parents feel are important to kind of focus on and then give us leeway for as well yeah um and it's it's just really interesting that the sorts of personality aspects of our parents that you know end up rubbing off uh, rubbing off off on us maybe mm -hmm. not directly but um you know you you subsequently um you know kind of go for, full force into into skating basically yeah. um, and you've sort of described a, a little bit of you know how you got there um really and um your dad sounds like a pretty pivotal part of it and your mum to an extent just mm -hmm. sort of being like okay with dad living vicariously through you maybe or yeah for sure something like for that sure. um, them two them two have always been super supportive too like if i look back on it now possibly more supportive and for longer than parents should like especially in like the skating realm like I would be 18 and there'd be like if it was a, a competition at the local skate park at Weymouth for example they would be there watching oh and, like, they watch yeah they were like well into supporting that kind of thing and like when I was younger obviously I was down because they like drive me to a competition and watch and it's like yeah cool but then like, I remember it getting to a point where I was like, I think it was like a best trick competition on like the down rail at Weymouth Skate Park in you know, that long one. And I think I was doing like a top acid to a true acid, which I wasn't that comfortable doing anyway. And I would just, you know, when like, you kind of get in that moment of a best trick competition, like, if I land this, I will win. Yeah. That's definitely not the case. <laughs> and anyway, I was doing like a missing, like top acid, stepping over to a true acid and missing that main foot and just like taking it on the rail. But obviously, like, when you're in that moment, it doesn't really matter. You're just going to do it again. Yeah. And I remember my mum looking at me from across the crowd being, that's enough now. <laughs> and I remember at that point being like, he can't come here anymore. Like, that, that can't happen. Like, I can't ask her to be, you've got to let me hurt myself. So I've got to ask her to just not be here anymore because that doesn't, you can't watch me do that. Yeah, you can't. I mean, asking a parent to watch you bagpipe a rail. Yeah, uh, repeatedly. I mean, it, it's, it's like uh, the perception of of damage of falling over of, of taking a, a knock uh mm. it's something that you know skating wise we've been i suppose subject to practicing trying to perfect in some ways like you know mitigating the 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 damage but you know i've had to keep that absolutely as a barrier of of in terms of knowledge of what i'm doing from mm -hmm. from my folks for the most part and you know that 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 
well, they kind of got a baptism as a fire, a baptism of fire when I broke my leg at 18, like really badly. And it's just like, do you want to not do that? Yeah. Like ever again, it's, it's like going to need an amputation or something, you know, yeah. the, the break was that bad. But um, I suppose I had like a, a sort of, not a bugbear, but it was just this sort of, my parents at least my dad my mum very occasionally but my dad would definitely come watch me play football and would sort of celebrate that side of me um but when I started skating I suppose I kind of kept it I kind of kept it away because I needed Mm. that I needed a bit of separation in terms of I'm doing this and it's got like these um tangents or avenues that I kind of want to do on my own sort of thing yeah and then and it's kind of got an element of like rebellion with it, hasn't it? So it's yeah. like I'm doing this stuff because parents aren't into it. So I kind of, yeah, I get that for sure. Yeah, I mean, I was uh, definitely um, in the media content and the consumption of what was happening in the skate world. You know, those those influential factors in terms of rebellion and, and opposing authority or getting into music and, and so on and so forth. Um, I suppose like, um, you know, corrode the kind of dependent at least emotionally dependent relationship you may have with with your parents and kind Mm. of forces you to want to be like your own person I guess but that's really interesting that the kind of you know the crossing over of that time for you was sort of parents coming to watch you at at competitions Uh, and that was that um, was it in important you said that they sort of stayed part of your life like that maybe in support of you longer than yeah, um, longer than is normal. Yeah, I think so. I was definitely. I mean, there, it sounds weird because, like, if you were to watch the X Games now, like the people that are winning, their parents will be there and be proud of them or whatever. Like, even like you know, Jaws, Ollie in that twenty-five stare, and his dad was there with him crying. Oh, really? Is, yeah. Did you have you? Oh, his dad was there. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy, man. Like they in, Le- in leon that yeah set in his leon. dad was there and they like popped a bottle of champagne at the bo- bottom and they're both crying and hugging and it's like that's cool isn't it you can't hate on that at all like his dad is there with him and like super proud but like putting that aside definitely at the time my parents were coming to watch me skate way older than what was cool <laughs> <laughs> you know i mean like that's yeah but like yeah i've always been super close to them so it makes complete sense but like yeah if I look back on it now like being I don't know 18 and your parents just like watching you at competition be like come on Scotty it's kind of like yeah I don't know I think I um I wasn't really able to invite like my parents into that arena after I'd fucked myself up so yeah, bad yeah. early doors it was like I just felt terrible like, we can't guilty this, Leon. You're hurting yeah yourself. yeah you're literally hurting yourself yeah (laughs) that's like all you're doing and they just couldn't um connect with um the kind of day-to-day or weekend to weekend experience of you know doing the thing doing the tricks um doing the moves learning the language and you know becoming involved in probably the like the environment of what where i was doing as well like weymouth skate park was definitely like a a parent friendly kind of you know it had like a a snack bar well most skate parks do but like a pool area that was like very i don't know just welcoming to parents and right on the seaside do you know what i mean like comparing that to like bay 66 playstation at the time like it's not as it's quite kind of gully in comparison isn't it yeah definitely like like a train line next to a like a housing estate like yeah, it's always been an edgy place yeah, like exactly. playstation bay 66 skate park um and yeah as you say like an environment that actually conversely is super family friendly and and kind yeah. of always has um welcomed um the parents of younger people we've had lessons there um skate lessons skateboard lessons and you've got like um you know pretty like you know like hollywood stars and very high profile people who live in west london in that very affluent area so there's like Mm. a cross section of the community in west london that does like filter through to like the um uh, use of the skate park Uh, and yeah so like the the fabric of that um sort of locality i suppose Mm. is is quite um um i suppose is lived through the skate park i guess so like weymouth as you say it's like this small town sort of everybody knows everybody cheesy welcoming 
kind of warm environment mm-hmm. and so why wouldn't you know that be a place for you know parents of a slightly older teenager yeah to skating to be yeah That's, exactly um, I mean when I started working there you just noticed that it was just a, a quite a cheap way like a cheap crash I guess for certain age groups like parents would like take their two kids like give a like they would give us like the workers like two pound extra and be like I'll get them like a pot noodle each at lunchtime or whatever like make them a pot noodle each and it's like we just looked after their kids for the day you know what I mean yeah. that's literally what happened yeah because it was what like a session was like three pound at the time or something you get three sessions in a day and then it's like nine pound each it's not expensive is it whole day let child care I mean yeah literally and then they're kind of learning and like they're they're, they're socializing they're communicating they're learning they're learning to take turns to share etiquette yeah. you know all of these things they're getting a bit of uh i suppose like cool points from hanging around with with older kids yeah. to an extent i guess um so you, you worked in weymouth skate park as well mm-hmm. for, for a long for a time bit, yeah Probably for a long when time i was like 15 until i was like i'd even, even when i went to uni and then i'd come back in the summer i would work there over the summer so like I was a long-standing a long time, job yeah. wow yeah. okay and do you still have links there to the skate park you know if you were to go no I mean I could go there and hang out probably but like there was a massive crossover very interesting it's a bit of a, like a long story but mm-hmm. so essentially the skate park is there because of Henry's mum did a lot yeah. of like bidding to get it yeah so she was she never really worked there but she was like the overseer of any decisions that happened there because she was the one that like got that skate park it was like lottery funded and for the first I think two or three years the lottery funding covered um, wages for the people that worked there too so obviously it was very stable for the first three years but then after that like obviously it, it's takings and stuff and it, you've been there right so you yeah. you know that like even in the winter it's got a roof on it but it doesn't really cover it yeah probably quite similar to PlayStation I don't yeah. know I haven't been there in the rain before but like rain gets in like probably 80 percent of the skate park um so yeah so obviously in the winter and stuff it's not taking much money and it's not covering the wages of the people that work there Mm. that's for sure so like it did start to kind of like deteriorate and get worse and worse and then there was like a when the scooter boom happened there was a lot of like scooter parents that would like Mm. hang out and be like they kind of formed their own community at the skate park and being like stuff needs to get better here and stuff like that right Mm. which I'm fully on board with and that makes complete sense because they just wanted it to be better. Like mm-hmm. They just had ideas and they had a work ethic, which I guess the 15 year old kids that worked there that were just smoking weed and hung over didn't have that same work ethic to make it tidy and safe and all sorts of other stuff that they kind of took over it like these parents and they started like doing whatever. And then I remember when I moved to Bournemouth, obviously I wasn't skating when we skate back half as much. So I remember going back there at one point and going in the door and the girl behind the kind of window to buzz you in through the buzzer. I was like, oh, hey, Tess, how's it going? She's like, yeah, cool. Like, come on in. And then as I like walked through the door, she like buzzed me in. There was a guy stood on the other side and he was like, what are you doing? And I was like, what? And he was like, you can't just walk in. And I was like, obviously, I don't have this like importance of being like, I do you know who I am coming here for free. But yeah. like. I'd been working there for like, or going there for like 10 years and had a massive part in building, like building ramps and like designing the website, like lots of stuff that I like had been involved with. Like Henry was like a brother to me for a long time. And his mum was the person that got it. He was the manager, at like loads of points. And it's like this random guy that I'd never seen before has been like, what are you doing coming in here? And I was like, what? So like immediately I was quite standoffish and was like, what? And I'm not like a fighty type of guy, but I was like, what? And then Tess was like, oh, no, it's Scott. He's like, he was like, I don't care who he is. He's not coming in for free. And I was like, so straight away, there was like a massive situation, but it got called out and I just went in and it was all right. I didn't skate because I was like, fuck that anyway. Yeah, but um, vibe kill. other people that were a bit more like resistant to that kind of behavior, like there was a guy called Jonesy who was a BMX who worked there and was the manager and built most of the ramps for a long time, started get, like not being allowed to go in. And it's like, What? like you can't just do that you just completely took over but on the flip side they definitely had a like a a good influence on making it do you know what i mean it's a very different place now it's very community like mm. lots of parents they just get like even parents just go there to have a coffee or whatever do you know what i mean so it's okay. 
they are bringing money in but at the same time you can't push out the people that kept it going for the 10 years previous yeah that's and um... actually i don't think they see the link between say someone like jonesy who's like because he's been working there and going there for so long he's a g- really good bmxer and got has got a lot of experience so having those kids looking up to someone that is actually good i don't think because they're not bmxers themselves they don't know what's good and what's not so they just look at him as this like waste man who's just like <laughs> yeah whatever and they're like you don't know how impactful having someone that's good at a skate park is like yeah, it's all yeah. good having all you scooter kids doing flips and just like learning stuff but having someone that is flowing about doing wicked stuff is so influential you need that is that is that sort of um the idea maybe of of having um like a relatable benchmark or yeah, I think you so. know somebody who is like a practitioner um they're a mainstay um mm-hmm. they're part of the furniture quite literally um but also um, have that experience and skill that provides you know some kind of inspiration yeah. to, to young people and I suppose like the the sort of the parents of the kids who are part of that scooter boom at the time um you know they're sort of looking at things um in a kind of improvement sort of financial kind of of way whereas mm. the the culture of skating and skate parks and how you know kids stay within that culture within practicing the discipline is really about the formative environment really mm. and it being stable being looked after properly and that's not just about um you know i suppose like crossing every t and dotting every i there's yeah. other things that are at play in the skate park that that create inspiration for kids and yeah kids for sure there. and it kind of skews the level if like if you only see good extreme sports on the tv or on your phone it's not it just seems like it's quite unreachable whereas yeah. if it's at your local park and this waste man is like doing all these tricks then it's much more attainable for sure. Like, I don't think I would have got to the level that I got if I didn't have older people that were just, you know, they weren't so far ahead that it was unbelievable to get there, but they were like, mm. you know, always ahead that you were just like trying to get there. Like, that ahead. makes a massive difference for sure. Yeah, I mean, definitely um, early, early doors. Um, I had a couple of uh, people um, who are still in my life now who I, you know, kind of look up to um, a great deal um who were you know much more experienced than I were older than I um who were able to do some of the moves that I had no business trying at that point um and so you know that it was always this sort of space to move into that I've got room to move into and develop I don't know when but I know I want it you know I want it badly kind of thing um yeah that's um so that's sort of um you know Weymouth Skate Park and this long-standing association with Weymouth Skate Park and your hometown. We've sort of been talking about your your upbringing, um, you know, in Weymouth and some of the relationships that are important. Obviously, with your parents helping you, um, you know, transit from place to place and you know being laissez-faire enough um, to kind of um, you know deal with the risk or, or actually even encourage you to take some risks as a young boy as a boy as a young man um and then you started I suppose like taking your own steps from from there on out practicing more and more um you mentioned earlier on um Harry Abel uh, um there are well I suppose there's a couple Harry's but you mentioned earlier on um Harry Abel um and you know I suppose those who may may listen to this conversation um with a view to you and some of the things that you've been involved with would think about um, the crew name or the content under the crew name DRC. Um, I'm sure you've spoken about DRC a little bit before, um, but would you say something about how DRC sort of came to fruition? Um, Was the name sort of coined in consensus? Um, was there a motivation to encapsulate what you guys were doing as a group of friends? And I, and I know that this is sort of zooming forward quite a bit from maybe the P 
period of um, the early year and sort of mid 2000s. But how does that how do those periods kind of close together and, and work out in your mind? Um, is that a big leap? Uh, it is a big leap, yeah, from Wayne Escape Park to DLC. But um, I mean, yeah, after working at Skate Park, I then I went to uni in London and I didn't really skate that much then. I guess I was focused on, you know, the classic. Like I skated probably once every two months or something and just went to PlayStation with James Dole Smith every now and again. So that was interesting. But then when I finished that, by the time I finished that, I then came back and I did a bit of traveling in America and then Portland Skate Park was built. Yep. And that was massive because... I don't know. I When I worked at Weymouth Skate Park, I didn't have a problem with wearing a helmet and stuff like that. But then that kind of formalizes you going out for a skate, I feel like. Like you have to, you're changing your attire and you're like, I'm ready to skate. Mm-hmm. Whereas Portland Skate Park was closer to where I lived, um, just about. And it was a concrete skate park, had such a perfect like practice, like down rail. And you didn't have to wear a helmet. And do you know what I mean? It was very, like, that changed everything. And up until that point as well, I feel like, me especially, I don't know if I can say for, like, Harry and Connor, but I wasn't that great at, like, skating ledge, like, an actual angle ledge, because mm. I grew up skating in Wayward Skate Park a lot. And it was just, cut like, anything that we, we could build whatever we wanted, essentially, as well. So we just build coping boxes, because it was, like... You just feel like a bit of a Superman if you do a true fish on a coping box. Just cope, coping just like that. Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> you can say that you did a true fish on a ledge, but we all know that that's very, very different <laughs> to doing it on a coping box. Um, so then when that escape park came about, like I realized, that, oh, right, I'm not actually that good at skating ledges. So that was really good for me in terms of doing that kind of thing. And also just like, I don't know, I feel like there was a transition between like us being around like parents and stuff, skating at Wave Escape Park, to just skating at Portland. It's just like, it was usually just me, Harry and Conair, just like, just hanging out, skating there. Um, and then through skating there, we met, well, I already knew about obviously like Mike Simpson, Scott Palmer, Ben Woodcock, Luke Terry, Twiggy. Um, mm. We already knew about those guys, but weren't really that close with them, I guess. Mm. Like, Where were they though, based? Yeah, even though like Bournemouth was like an hour away, we didn't really ever like meet up that often. And they came down and skated there. And we just, I don't know, we just all hung out and skated that day. And we decided, I know that me and Henry were talking about like going to Barcelona for a bit, just like, Mm -hmm. and I was at that point roofing with my dad. So I could just take a holiday when I wanted. It didn't really matter. Um, And then we were talking to Mike about it. Mike was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's do two weeks. And then we were like, why not do a month? And we were like, yeah, Mm -hmm. right, let's do a month. So then we kind of organized at that point that me, Henry, Bradley Baker which is mad now thinking about it he kind of skated at the time but like thinking about he was one of the people that came to Barcelona with us for a month makes absolutely zero (laughs) sense like the type of guy that he is like he was so fun to have with us but like what the day that we got there he signed up to the gym for the month so he could go to the gym as many times as he wanted to right okay which is not the same as like Mike Simpson for example you know like that's a a mad thing that happened but anyway all (laughs) us four went to Barcelona for a month like we got a place that was before like airbnb and stuff so what year is this like 2011 i couldn't tell you off the top of my head I guess it would have been maybe 2010 maybe a bit earlier maybe a bit earlier okay. yeah so maybe okay. 2010 um and yeah so that was my first kind of introduction to proper mike simpson which was interesting. So, <laughs> mike simpson mark one <laughs> yeah right it, like him I remember like getting off of the coach, like, you know, you get the plane to Geneva, you go to, um, not Geneva. What am I thinking of? Um, I was going to say, that's a long way around. Yeah, yeah, that would be a, a mad, mad route. Jesus. <laughs> um, yeah, then get the coach to Barcelona. And I remember getting off the coach and us looking for our apartment that we had rented, just walking in the group of four of us, turn around the corner and we're like, where the fuck's Mike Of course gone? he's not there. Of course he's yeah. gone. Like, where the fuck's of Mike course. gone? He's gone off to a shop just to like get something, not said anything. And then we're just like looking around and he just turns up next to us again, like 10 minutes later after we've all been looking. He's like, all right. And we're like, the fuck? And he did that about three times in the fact that the time that we were trying to get to our thing. And we're just like, who is, what is this guy up to? Like, you can't just lose him now. Like, we didn't have phones or anything that we were like working. We're just like, just go missing for a bit and then come back again. Mad. So, yeah, interesting 
interesting getting to know Mike in that scenario. And then the other guys like Colum and uh yeah, the other guy Colum. I don't think Bean came with us then, but Colum, Scott Palmer, Luke Terry, Cy Parsons, they all came out for like 10 days and Conair did as well. He came out for like seven days in like the middle of it somewhere or 14 days maybe. So that was really good for us to like bond as a group. Mm. We never really like got to know each other that well, but like being in a apartment with Mike Simpson for a month really kind of gets you to understand who he is. That'll learn you, yeah, for sure. I mean, I've, I've had the pleasure. Um, do, so you, you, you sort of chose to go out to Barcelona um, as, a, as a group. Mm -hmm. That was the first kind of group formal, like, we're a, we're a thing? We're no, like not a thing, really. Or? I mean, Mike made an edit. Mike was fresh out of uni then of, like, studying media or whatever, and he made a really cool video of us. And that kind of... When I got home, after watching the video that he made, I bought a camera, the same camera that he was using, a GH1 that we had hacked. And from then on, me, Harry and Conair filmed loads in Weymouth, like real bad like SLR videos to like music that wasn't even my type of music, but I thought it was cool and rollerblade at the time. But when I, now when I look back on it, it was so off the mark. It's unbelievable, but it's interesting to watch a hacked gh1 would you care yeah, so to elaborate what that means a gh1 is a panasonic i think i've got it here somewhere hold on i still use it now it's wicked do i have it here no it must be downstairs but it's a, a still GH1. in use downstairs yes downstairs <laughs> but um a panasonic gh1 and when it came out it's kind of a, a bit of a shit camera it's kind of the, one of the first mirrorless cameras so it was like it's kind of like an slr but not really it's sort of like a compact one so it looks but, like a, it looks like a still shot camera yeah looks like a snap right yeah but um it somebody realized that it had much more potential than the firmware was like the software on it was like giving out so you could hack it and then kind of make it let in as much information. But basically it had a restriction on how much information it would take onto the memory card at one time. So okay. you could hack it and like allow it to bring more. And at the time, like you'd have to spend quite a lot, but you could get a memory card that could take in like a hundred megabytes per second, for example, mm. but you could hack it. So it brought on like 90 megabytes per second. So it was much sharper. And there was a lot of like um, video comparisons of being like, oh, it's better than the 5D. It's better than the 7D. And that was when they were just first mm. coming out. But mm. the 7D and the 5D were like, you know, a lot, a lot of money. Yeah. And the GH1, I bought mine for 200 quid. So it was like, it was wicked at the time. I loved it. Um, so yeah, me and Harry made loads of stuff with that. Me, Harry and Conair. Um, and during that time, Scott Palmer made a Facebook group that was for us to all like communicate in. Mm. And he called it, I can't remember now what it's called off the top of my head. I think, it, I don't know what the C stood for, but it was like Dorset rollerblading, we call it club now because I feel like that's funnier. But like, yeah. I think it was like collective or community or I don't think it was crew, but it was something okay. like that just to be like, it wasn't even like, oh, this is a crew. It was more like, oh, if you find spots or whatever, put them here. Just like a, a page for us to all communicate on. Right, right. And that's what it was. But then since then, we kind of just like, because we thought it was funny because it's kind of ridiculous. It's like Dorset rollerblading club <laughs> or crew or whatever. We just kind of kept it. And then later on, when we were making the video, kind of halfway through filming the DRC video, Ben had the idea of, because it was quite British, like the way we wanted to represent it, mm -hmm. he was like, it's BBC, like it makes complete sense. Let's make it a parody of BBC. And it was perfect, like straight away, we were like, yeah, I mean, that's, that's perfect. That's the idea, isn't it? Fascinating. Um, one of the things that um, I'd kind of wanted to ask you, and I suppose I would like just sort of zoom straight ahead into that question, um, was a little bit about um, pulling in aspects of British pop culture, um, you know, like into the work. And mm -hmm. you've just sort of spoken about the kind of beginnings of DRC um, and the kind of formulation of your like group as it were, online through Facebook to sort of share spots and that kind of thing. Um, and the sort of, um, you know, genesis of DRC being coined by Scott Palmer sort of thing, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, British, it seems British pop culture is quite prevalent in your work, kind of as a whole. Um, and in cer certainly 
um, if you go onto the uh, Vimeo um, for DRC and you look at the trailers and then actually watch like the first full length uh, video, it's like 40 minute video. You have an incredible section in that, you know, you open the video. I think Simpson closes the video. Um, but there's a clip of Tom York, right, mm -hmm. of Radiohead in, in the full length video. Um, He's talking about the nature of recycling trends in clothing and sort of doing what you want within a melting pot of ideas is sort of like a preferable place to be. It's a good place to be. Would you talk about the influence of British pop culture in your creative vision and mm -hmm. how DRC crew was underpinned by it? Yeah, I mean, that particular clip, I mean, I don't know if you know, but the kind of idea of that video was that we would all edit our own section oh okay okay and that i think i heard that before but yeah i mean yeah. that that yeah that was that was cool actually that was really good for us to learn how to edit each i mean i'd done a bit of video editing before but not really a, like a, a whole kind of thing like that but um that particular clip that you're talking about the tom york one was at the start of harry's section so that was him that chose to put that in oh there. i see so those kind of like um british kind of clips that are in there are each person's individual choices i guess okay not okay. all of them i remember at the start of mike's one there's a top of the pops bit that we kind of we decided between us what to put between certain edit like sections um at the start of mine there's some blue peter stuff which is mm -hmm. so british um but that kind of went with the idea of you know being coming up with the idea of bbc um and it just it it made complete sense like we also had issues where um some of it was filmed on SLR, some of it was filmed on High 8, some of it was filmed on VX. Um, and now that's not really much of a problem in like, you know, you get Premiere up or Final Cut. It's not too much of a problem mixing all that stuff together. But yeah. it was kind of in a time where we were trying to work out how we could do that. And kind of the element of having it a bit more collage a bit more sample based made complete sense of it being disjointed because then it just kind of works. And if you see at the start of the video, like you see the, like, the little one pop up, it's like mm. you're changing channels. So changing channels and the, the format changing a little bit, it kind of hid the idea that um, the footage wasn't really matching. Because <clears throat> at that point as well, we weren't that advanced in editing to like make everything try and match. That would have been a massive job. And my, my iMac at the time, which we did it all on, probably wouldn't have been able to handle it anyway, which is part of why it's all filmed off the screen. So one, one thing about that video is it's all filmed completely off script, or, or, like it's filming my iMac playing the video. Wow. Okay. I had heard that before. Yeah. So you weren't able to render the project. No. So, so I, d <laughs> I remember. Why did you do that? <laughs> you don't, this is a big learning curve because we... <laughs> the trailers and the, the end of the trailer i think everybody was saying to me let's not put a date on the trailer but because i don't know just the type of person that i am i wanted to create a graphic with like the title and stuff like that so i did because i was like we've got loads of time like it's finished basically like let's just put a, a date on there and a time and then i was i remember going to work and being like oh, it's going to take ages to render i'll just like click render go to work come back and it'll be done and i remember being like maybe Harry wasn't at work at the time or something. I remember going home at lunchtime and being like, I needed to sort it out because it, the render didn't work. And essentially if I look, I looked at the error code and it was something to do with like there being too many different formats and it just yeah, wasn't standard. having it. And I was like, oh, I don't know what to do. But now I'm so much more experienced in it. I, there's so many things that I could have done to make that work. Like so many things I can think of. So I remember trying to like import into After Effects and render it from there and loads of different stuff. And I couldn't do it. I was just like, boys, I can't do it. <laughs> it won't work. <laughs> um, so what we ended up doing was just like recording the screen, just playing it back in Premiere and recording the screen. And that's what you see on the uh, video yeah, yeah, file. The, the, yeah. Do you think that um, in terms of the outcome, you know of the video being filmed is it a bet is it a better video because of that because yeah, you've you've done that and yeah it also ties in like the different you can still notice the different formats but not as much you can so still the, see an slr fisheye like you can tell that a mile off can't you but like it does yeah it all a bit more i think 
so there's something about like the the different lenses i suppose and the different sensors and lenses and information that comes in and then what is then yeah. coming out i, I guess mean, it was a long and, time ago as well the computer was not digging it at all that's uh yeah i mean that's definitely a bit of like gorilla um inline skate video making yeah. you know filming um off of the screen because the computer says no yeah basically. i actually have a recording on my dropbox somewhere of the audio of us having a chat while that recording was happening really which is cool yeah this is a cool recording and, to have. and that's feeding back on what you guys are seeing at that moment in time and whether you guys were stoked or not about yeah, the, yeah, yeah, what, what, what things about, were looking like yeah i mean there's not too much of that because i think we watched for it watched it through a load of times before then but there's just like just the conversation of us like in mine and harry's flat at the time in the middle of bournemouth it's like it's quite a nice memory to have i'm really glad that i kept that the whole time did you um, premiere that first video um, as such, like all together, sort of like this is the final um, take? I don't think um, we did the final thing, but we gave ourselves deadlines for the sections to be done. So then it was really cool because not any other person knew what each other's section was going to look like because we edited it all individually. So like, yeah, we I, there was one time where like you had to like come to our drc hq which we called it at the time you had to come to hq with your file ready and then we just like watched them all through it was wicked that that's was. yeah that sounds awesome um you've got the hq you've got um each uh you know like rider of the crew seeming to be um you know knowledgeable of the editing process of the kind of encapsulation of what you guys were doing as a group mm -hmm. individually um how, how is it that everybody was able to edit, actually? You know, how is that possible? It, it seems that, um, you know, if I look around me in terms of the, the people who I've known throughout skating, I mean, a lot of people have ended up, you know, in the media professions, I suppose, yeah. or art professions. But I suppose it's quite rare for a video to have riders each editing their, their own section. Is it Was it important for each person to stamp their kind of identity their um you know position with skating um on top of the drc kind of thing or was that part of just making it what it is and you're just going to see how it came out i can't really remember why the decision came about but in hindsight it was probably you know there's people like me mike me and mike both studied like at arts unis doing that kind of course do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Harry also went to arts uni and did like sound. So he had kind of an element of an idea of how timelines and stuff worked. And we worked on stuff before then. So he knew how to edit. So I think it was, and then also like, you know, artistic approach, like would know how to edit a little bit, but there was people like Scott Palmer, Twiggy, Dan Lovelace had a section. He didn't edit his actually Twiggy also edited Dan Lovelace's section. Um, Conair, like the rest of us were like art uni dropouts, you know, but like those guys were not. And there definitely was def an element of like it being unfair to be like, yeah, you, you edit your own section looking back on it now. Like everyone was cool at the time about it, but looking back on it now, it's like, why would we not have someone like Mike overlook everything? Yeah. Which we did actually me, Mike and Harry and Ben definitely like helped people out if they needed it and like overlooked and been like, oh, you could probably move that about. Mm. But I don't know, just leaving... Like Scott Palmer bought a laptop so he could have a section, so he could edit it. Oh wow, commitment! He needed one anyway, but like looking back at that commitment now, he had just come back from traveling in Australia for like two years, and came back and just like did a section quicker than anyone else, like rinsed it, and then bought a laptop to edit that section because he's like, I want a section in this video. That's super cool. Yeah, so you know, from almost the outset before that formal first forty minute video had come out most of the guys who you guys have been hanging out together talking together skating together mm -hmm. um this idea of um creating something having like an aesthetic you guys obviously met uh, you know and had some common ground mm -hmm. with what you were aiming for um enough for scott palmer to have come back from travels probably emptied his wallet like with what money do you have coming back from yeah. travels to get into you know buying a new mac and yeah you know, i suppose you're saying that he needed it anyway yeah um so you, you kind of drop this video um 
and you know there were like subsequently numerous um releases um eventually um you know i became aware of drc and i think that was like my kind of entry point to your work and harry's and you know louis columns mm -hmm. you know ev everybody everybody else and you know i started to um you know watch all of the videos you know on the vimeo um what so what kind of period of time um are we sort of talking about drc being active um as like a crew as a group with um you know the motivation to put together skate videos like how long was that sort of operational for mm, i think we straight after drc video we made quite a lot um we definitely filmed a lot we stacked a lot and then made uh vp01 was first and then well vp03 was first then one then four and then like seven between those there was like there should have been a park section one that we had loads of footage of um it's sad that that never really surfaced because that was like probably a half an hour like video of like skate park tricks because mm. we always kind of separated the two which yeah. looking back on it we didn't really need to do but in the time of filming one two no one three and four all of the skate park footage that got collected along that same period of time as the street footage that definitely there was parts that were edited and stuff and it just didn't been um edited quite a lot of it and then decided he didn't like it so deleted the timeline he was definitely that kind of guy which like his standards were so high for himself and everything else that he was just like nah that can't be it and that and then it just kind of like drifted off it just didn't end up happening it just footage became too old and then by the time that i wanted to resurface the footage which is the video that you're in you know the one that when we went camping yeah I resurfaced some of the old skate park footage for that that's only the footage that i had there was a hard drive that had like way more than that and i didn't have it so i just kind of put out the footage that i had of that kind of time and was like that needs to be out i think so i did that but um to answer your question how much time probably Oh, it's hard to say actually because there was definitely times of it kind of like you know there's peaks and troughs of like how active we were times when Mike moved to London and then came back and obviously having him around made it more um, fruitful in terms of clips and things and Con Air being about a lot really helped the amount of footage and stuff we had and the amount of stuff we were going out but then he kind of you know stopped I guess um scott palmer stopped skating kind of all together then kind of drifted out so it's kind of i'd say maybe like four or five years of like us actually like going pretty hard with filming and stuff so like together. 2011 to 17 sort of thing that kind yeah, of that sounds about right, frame. Yeah. A couple of things. You, you guys went on, you described going away the first time to Barcelona for a, a month long trip. I know that you guys subsequently went on some other trips, notably um, Copenhagen. Did yeah. you want to say something? Because it's an amazing video. One, one deck? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, would you want to say something about, um, you know, I suppose that trip? filming for one deck and and you know some of those times um in in other countries did that one kind of was wicked that was such yeah. a good time thinking about that now so that was only that was me harry and conair just us three and we went out there which doesn't seem very me at the time but i guess it was just an excuse to go there but there was like a street competition at the time mm. and we went out there and actually at that time we were going hard with skating because just before i think the day before we flew out Sam and Anthony from Dirtbox mm -hmm. came and stayed in Bournemouth for like two or three days, which mm -hmm. was the first time I ever met either of those. Mm -hmm. And just before that, we'd started communication with them. Like Sam just sent us a message on Vimeo being like, I'd like to do something with you guys. We really like what you're doing. And that was a massive turning point in skating as well, for sure. Obviously, I'm sure we'll get onto that at some point. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, them coming down and we like, we filmed loads of stuff that weekend with them just like hanging out and skating and showing them the city or the town a little bit and then literally 
we then the next day went and skated in Copenhagen. So we were skating quite a lot, like back to back, like days back to back. And I remember being excited as well because we weren't really sure what the situation was with Dirtbox then. Um, I don't know if Sam will see it the same way because he may have thought that it was quite clear, but it wasn't for us. We were like, we were getting wheels and we didn't really know what the situation was, but it was just very exciting because obviously Dirtbox was wicked. And yeah, so then we, we were obviously in Copenhagen with like an excitement of that going on in the background. And also just like, I remember me meeting Carson Starnes and Al Hui was out there and it was just a wicked time. There's so many bladers. I'd never been to any of like, I know Harry and that had all, all been to like IMYT Amsterdam when that happened, but I hadn't really been in much of a situation where just there were so many bladers in one place at the same time. Actually, I went to Winter Clash before then, so I had experienced that. But oh. like, do you know what I mean? Like when you go, it was it was quite a small like street competition but being in a city where like there's so many bladers there for one thing and that i don't know it's just a very cool situation was that the blade days was that what it was blade days in copenhagen yeah, that, 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 yeah i can't remember what it was called off the top of my head it was i think it was organized by blackjack at the time maybe yeah yeah I'm, but it was sure. it was a very cool competition very and cool. i suppose like um we all know the um challenges of um I suppose, communicating effectively at Winter Clash, you know, it's like, it's tricky. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just fucking, you know, overwhelming. It's rough on your voice. It's uh, lots of stimulus and, you know, it's wild borderline suicidal skating kind of going on as well. So it's, it's just like a bit much at times, um, yeah. but no, no less, um, you know, kind of awesome situation to be in. And I suppose like the Blade Days, Copenhagen environment, you're saying was your sort of first, um, I suppose, experience with other notable sorts of high profile elite skaters. And uh, that you... no, I, I couldn't say that because when we were skate park, people used to come there all the time. I remember seeing mm -hmm. Chaz when he was at his peak, just like 540 True Top Soil in that yeah. box, just like literally as a warm up. Like, I'm not even joking. He yeah, just, Pete Chaz is just jokes. Right? Absolute joke. Like, and then, yeah, I remember going to an SYS in Bristol as well. Did you ever go to one of those? Uh, yeah, I did um, SYS in Milton Keynes. Wow. I think I I, there was some suicidal skating in that as well. I done some suicidal <laughs> skating in that, I think. Um, but I, I think I... Um, I think I did pretty well in, in, in that one. I no, I don't think I won it. I would have remembered if I'd won it, but I definitely like. I remember doing well. I yeah. think I, I I podiumed or something. I have pictures in a Unity magazine of like doing shit at show your shit. Yes, showing my shit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like so, sort of being at Blade Days Copenhagen, but it wasn't just oriented around being at the event. That was no, a no. We spent. I can't remember how long we were there for. Maybe like, I think just over two weeks. Maybe we stayed in oh. a hostel, which was kind of long actually. By the end of it, hostel. Yeah, yeah. It was, all, I mean, it was all right, but it was like in a room where there was like I don't know twenty four other people. It's like it's a bit long. When oh, you're wow. knackered and you just after skating, you just want to not be in a room full of people doing. Diablo and all sorts of other stuff. <laughs> yeah, uh, you, you you need to you need to wind down, and I suppose um, in the years to come from those earlier trips spent in hostels, you've got a bit more available resources to kind of rent yeah, yeah. a space and and you know get the the hot tub and. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Actually, a guy staying in there probably for seven of the days that was, you know, those guys that go out and they just like paint themselves silver and they're like a statue for like the day. Yeah. He yeah. was staying there and he'd come back in like and just like not get out of his attire for a good evening as well. Just like he'd just be like chilling on his phone, just like on the bed next to us, just in silver. <laughs> Is it just like well long to, to just. Yeah, I guess like, so. Maybe just yeah. like. I'm just gonna have to put it back on tomorrow, so I'll just keep it on. I don't know. Like evening shift, yeah. Maybe there's like a, a bottom layer that you know, if he's working three days on the trot, it's just like, look, I might as well keep the bottom layer on. Yeah. You know, it's just long tomorrow morning. And um, also, you don't when you come back from skating, you don't want to have to go for a shower in like the shared shower. So not, oh, it's just not what you want, is it? Thinking back on it, we've done our fair share of of hostel stuff, and I think actually 
in some of the earlier skate trips, definitely for 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 myself and some of the the London guys who you know we went on these trips, um, being sort of like you know dunking ourselves into um, you know an environment that would force a bit of socialising, that would force a yeah. bit of um, you know taking on board those sorts of people you know in the silver guy or you know a, a group from so and so that just give you a different feel, some different looks in conversation. I mean that. Mm-hmm. I think you know, like developing your social skills is is a massive part yeah. of of being involved in skating and helping you kind of come outside of um, you know some of those parameters socially that that you're within. I mean, sure. I think I think going out and skating, you ultimately do need a bit of a, a bit of privacy amongst yourselves just to kind of feel a bit better about having gone and taken some knocks and yeah. check the footage out and you know have that yeah, privacy. Yeah. But yeah, and um, so. You, you filmed the video you filmed one deck um what was the um what was the last what was the sort of closing video um you know drc wise yeah what was the the no, closing hasn't really been um if i think back to the probably the last video was the the camping one i think yeah that was 2017 wasn't it yeah if I remember um, rightly most of that footage isn't from that time anyway so it would have been before then I think let me have a look on the Vimeo now I think <coughs> there was one called EC3 which was HD mm. and you've got a clip in that as well actually um, you do like a Royale cess slide over a bench and then oh, yeah. I can't remember what the second trick was yeah. an alley-oop a porn star to forward Maybe, yeah, maybe porn star to forward. I remember I filmed that as well, and that was one of my first experiences of skating with you, actually. I think you... I was a bit uh, nervous. I was a bit like, oh, I'll film with Leon now. You, 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 you filmed... I actually remember this. You filmed that clip, and I was really stoked to be um, just kind of associated with you guys, I suppose, based on... Um, the relationships that were to come like for instance you know Mike moving in and ending up living with Mike for a couple of mm-hmm. years but you know I was already um really um inspired and um found the work under DRC to be substantial have depth it was interesting so for me to like explore like my own skating through that framework through that lens like literally being filmed by you I remember being like really really stoked really really excited and I and there was uh, an impetus to sort of change or skate in a way a little bit outside of where I'm usually kind of situated. And I remember you saying after we got that line, I remember you saying something along the lines of that, like you said something like that. You said something like that was well DRC. You you, you said about the line was well DRC, yeah. and then <laughs> and I was just like oh shit like so is this is this like a way is it is it a way of that you guys are skating that you're sort of um trying to be outside of said consensus boxes of Mm -hmm. skating and I suppose it impressed on me that there were deliberately different ways of taking your skating and and really kind of um you know carefully designing your skating as per what the other influential factors yeah. are for you and and that was quite an important sort of like oh that's that's is that what he means by that yeah. you know but it just yeah anyway I thought I'd I no thought that I'd... is interesting and that's something that I didn't I definitely didn't have in me until hanging out with the rest of the DRC for sure like skating in Weymouth and if you if you watch that first Barcelona video that we were talking about I literally have white carbons with teal ground control feather lights on them and I'm wearing a teal watch to match those frames yes so wild the you can imagine the type of skating that I was doing and was into with that kind of influence involved I guess And that's kind of not even that old in the grand scheme of things. I'm not talking about like I was well young at that point. I was old enough to know what I was doing. And not to say that that's like bad or whatever, but the transition to where I am now definitely came about because of, you know, people like Mike and Ben, like having them around and kind of, 
I never really linked the two things of like being artistic and creative with rollerblading. Like they are both things that I was very interested in, interested in, but I never really merged the two, which is really weird thinking about it now because it's so obvious and it's kind of like obvious. always been there. Like even watching things like words, how did I not link the two in my head? But I don't know, like it might surprise people to know that I'm, I was very late on kind of like that kind of idea and like mushroom blading even, I was on that well late. And as soon as I discovered that it was like, oh, right, yeah. You don't have to just do a top sole and you don't have to 180 off when you do a top sole. You can land forwards if you want. It's your own thing. I think you you even um, do a slalom um, manoeuvre um, with the equivalent of what would be cones. I can't yeah, quite yeah. remember in in the in your part, I think, in yeah, the, in the, the full length, video, yeah. in the DRC. So you can kind of see that, that influence sort of creeping in there that um, was partly because of the song as well he says something about ice skating in the song so i wanted like something ab to... abs absolutely and then i think later on um in that section you're also doing a front side on a brick wall and i think um you've got um a task force tune and mm -hmm. i think it's either farmer or chester p sort of saying something about something being gully essentially like the and but what I process that as is well you know there's a um a connection with the lyrics that you're hearing and the clearly evidenced terrain which is mm -hmm. you know not that nice for for doing our sorts of slides on our brick walls so like we know that mm -hmm. um you know so that kind of crossing over of of arts I suppose is something that's it's massive in skating as yeah, you say yeah. it's like obvious it's always been there but you were into music like as a kid right you you've been into music for a long time in your life yeah the type of music that i was into definitely changed with blading though for sure like it's very like thinking about now how impressionable i was it's really funny that like i before i was into skating the first time that i went to beta skate park i had a slipknot t-shirt on and i was listening to it on my walkman Yikes. like that's definitely what was Amazing. happening and i was very into like i went to like ozfest and download festivals you know i was into that kind of stuff and then when I started skating properly and realizing that it was quite hip hop influenced and quite hip hop based, I kind of, it was sort of natural, but at the same time, I remember sort of forcing myself to like hip hop. I was like, right, if I'm going to be in this and whatever, like I need to like hip hop. And I remember like the first hip hop album that I properly listened to was like Jay-Z Blueprint 2 because of the murder section in, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't remember which, what video it was, but. There's a few videos where he's used Jay Z actually. Yeah, definitely. Um, but um, yeah, and I forced myself to like like it. So that's quite a funny introduction to hip hop as well. It's like Jay Z Blueprint Two, which is a weird one. Um, and then I realised even before then that there was like a transition from like skating being kind of like in turning into rocky music. And I remember being like, oh no, I've just like transitioned into hip hop. I've missed the boat already. <laughs> But then, like, quite shortly after that, I was like, oh, right, I'm on my own person. I can listen to what the fuck I want to or what I actually like. That's probably a good idea. But, yeah, it's weird. Like, I was definitely too old to be influenced that easy. It wasn't as, like, black and white as that, you know, but I definitely remember being like, right, okay, I'm into blading now. Like, hip-hop, I should probably like that. And then transitioning out again. It's kind of the same as, like, right, I need to wear baggy joggers. Oh, right, now I need to wear skinny jeans. It's a similar transition, isn't it? It's like, we all did that. And we were all too old to be doing that. Well, you, you wanted to, um, I suppose, express your um, identity um, in, in certain ways. And so this sort of one stage of that, I guess, is, you know, you're, you're aware that there's music, there's pop charts. And, you know, I think somewhere along the way, we become um, attached to music. It just, it somehow just happens, whether it's, you know, for me, it was sort of the first, like having a Walkman, my dad's Walkman in my hand and just playing music in headphones. And it's like, this is just encumbering. This is just yeah. all immersive. And so just that idea that your awareness, your attention, your state of mind could be kind of like directly, you know, sort of influenced was I suppose the first thing, but then I didn't really, um, you know, start becoming more intensely interested in music till a little bit later on. Um, and yeah, like skating then synthesizes interest in music even more so. So for you, like transitioning from maybe alternative rap, uh, alternative metal type music 
um, then taken on hip hop and rap music. Um, you'd seen hip hop and rap music, Jay Z, Murder Johnson, but you know, like what? How does music? How does music get you going in terms of skating? You know, like where where are the the dots connecting? Is it rhythm? You know, like one of the things that you would do when listening to metal music, I suppose, is like headbanging. You know, mm-hmm. like that's that's a pretty common sort of agreed response to to metal music is kind yeah. of nodding the head, headbanging. But then I suppose there's substance to the music, which does make you think about other things that go yeah. on in you and in the world. And I suppose rap music has its quality as well. So would you say anything about, you know, yeah, how does music get you going in that sense for skating? Like, Yeah, interesting. I think you just need a particular vibe. Like sometimes I'll have footage and I'll be like, I need this type of song to go with it. And that's kind of an easy like piece to the puzzle. But sometimes you you definitely would have this as well. And a lot of people that like also edit and make videos that like be in the car, a song that I've never heard of comes on and you, you're not even, you don't even know exactly why, but you're like, this will, this works for skating like straight away. And I don't even know what it is. I don't know if it's tone or speed or whatever, but you just, and then like, even if like you're, I've had it before where I'm like halfway through filming something and I haven't chosen songs yet and you hear a song like that and you're like you just envision the tricks that you already know that you have to it and you're like it just fits I don't know why but it just it totally just fits so I think a lot of the time it's not I couldn't even explain it it just it fits but some of the other times it's like I know that I want a particular type of beat I know that I mean my it, my music that I use for sections and stuff doesn't span that wide i've used a lot of kanye and i've used a lot of pink floyd and i've used actually in the early days i used a lot of ratatat as well which is quite interesting looking back on it now um but i don't know i think you have to know a song inside out as well to edit to it properly and Mm -hmm. i can only do that obviously with songs i really enjoy sometimes i don't know i don't know how i would back in the day with skate videos i guess skaters could choose their tune and the editor was just like okay that's the tune that we're using regardless if they enjoyed it or not and i think that would be really really tough because you have to like listen to it so many times over to just know it inside out because i don't know like for me hitting beats and stuff is really important i don't really like having a clip in there that doesn't really sit where it should sit so it's a massive puzzle piecing scenario and I, i just think you just know like sometimes many times i have it where i'm like yeah that song's gonna work chuck it in the timeline play about with it for like 15 minutes and be like hey, just it's not gonna work just have to get rid of it and try something else and sometimes i've had i've had tracks in my mind like in a spotify playlist or whatever or like folders on my computer that's just been like this is gonna work for a skate video at some point and it's been in there for like seven years and it's, it will get used at some point but sometimes you just gotta get the right skating you know the right the right person or the right scenic scenario that it will work is a song structured like a skate section like and and then so the person then kind of fits somewhere in between where those two things cross over because they've got like a structure to their like whatever their journey their life how Mm -hmm. they identify how they're seen yeah that that... yeah there's a lot of people that are good at that as well like choosing the right tune for the right you know saying like a gritty london section like choosing the right tune for that there's a lot of options that you have but you and other people like johnny in the past have made really good decisions of like that really does capture that and i think yeah that really helps too doesn't it um i remember making a song for mike pachapsky and using a song that he sings and that just hit straight away really easy to edit to i don't know if it was because like i just knew that it was him that was singing it but it just like it made sense to his skating very quickly the type of person he is like quite quick and erratic Mm. and like Mm. i think yeah a lot of stuff like that does i mean yeah um i think i learned a lot from editing to music from harry as well like obviously he's very um in tune with that kind of thing and kind of telling me what sounds to listen out to and what will work with other things and i think that really does help um but there's nothing better than like a solid landing landing on a solid beat like it's so good what is it about that you know like the head is... banging, banging thing even if you're listening to hip-hop like you're still bobbing aren't you so if like a, a landing mm. that's just like doosh, hits at the right time like even if you hit it like slightly off the beat 
not slightly off, it has to be quite a fuck. But like, I don't know, there's places where you can hit it in like the different pockets as well that aren't mm-hmm. necessarily on the beat that mm-hmm. also just like really hit. I love that. So it's kind of like a, you know, it's kind of like a, a punctuation and emphasis that's going on there in terms of like hitting beats mm-hmm. sort of thing. Um, Not even and- like always hitting beats though as well. I remember um, it becoming obvious to me in that first Barcelona section that Mike made there's a point where Henry is fit. Like there's a long shot of Henry doing a trick and he's skating. And then he like bumps off a curb after he's done it. And it's not even like a, you don't can't see his feet. It's not like an obvious like thud mm. or anything, but he just kind of like, you can see in his body that he like hits off the curb. And there's a part in the song that's not a beat, but just like a certain sound that like matches it really well. And I remember that being a really like Eureka moment for me being like, ah, like it doesn't need to just be beats and things like, hearing little bits in songs and it doesn't even need to be immediately obvious to everybody but just having those little like easter eggs in there is really nice i like that a lot that's a really cool idea the the easter eggs idea i mean i suppose i think of kinder eggs you know with their little surprises (laughs) within them and you're not not know what's going to come out but um it's like um there's i suppose like a there's like layers of substance or complexity or there's um some meanings there that are just satisfying to like discover i -hmm. guess you know like if you discover that that small gesture that bump in the body where you know that there was a a curb or something that needed to be navigated you could say is uh um, not relevant in the the sort of overall move or or even yeah you could even cut it you could even cut it um but even those sort of nuanced movements fit in the overall kind of experience of, of watching the skating with the music and there are other things that are at play that are just easter eggs basically yeah. and even cuts where like the motion is going in the same direction how much impact that has on the what like not irking the watcher like in big wheels two in leon basin section where he's like he does like a kick over a pole and then it cuts to another trick where he's got his like leg in the air and it's like immediately that's so it gives it just gives a massive amount of rewatch yeah, like that, I think that's what's important because it, especially now when like rewatch isn't a massive thing, you can watch something and then just, you know, you move on, don't you? It's not. Yeah. So the nature of the, the surprise is is never quite nailed down. No, exactly. It, yeah. That, that, so that, I think that's a really good thing to try and put in everything, isn't it? It's just like if you watch it for the fifth time and you like, huh, I didn't notice that in it before. That that is one of the the, the coolest um things that um happen when you're watching skating um and i do i do certainly think that you know you yourself um are a master of implementing those sorts of of edits in the work and that's definitely what has sort of kept me um interested in what you know you've been doing as a skater and as an editor for sure um you know so I suppose we we just kind of um, touched on some ideas around um, the use of music in in editing skating and I guess those entry points into kind of taking on board music and you know kind of what that means and you know how you identify the different types of music and express the you know the identity of that music and that's important because you're latched on to those forms of music for for various different reasons. I suppose we touched on the sort of, um, you know, anti-authoritarian sort of rebellion kind of aspect of when you get swept up by skating and music seems to like kind of go hand in hand, you know, with that and helping you along with that. Mm -hmm. Um, But I suppose we were also just talking about, um, you know, DRC um, as a crew, as a group, um, really like, producing this amazing uh, collection of, of content that developed some of these quite, you know, sophisticated ideas, um, you know, with skate media video production. Um, just to sort of, you know, have a think about how things sort of, uh, you know, ended with DRC, I, I, I suppose, in, in some mm. degrees. I, I, to what extent does the ambition and trajectory um, of the crew augment or change your own personal direction in skating or or in life you know you mentioned that 
um, people sort of went different directions, maybe they are starting families, whatever, these other sorts of, you know, how does that, yeah, how did that augment or, or change your own direction, you know, in terms of things with DRC? Mm, interesting. I just want to hit a point quickly because I said that EC4 was the latest one that we did. And actually, there's quite a few after that. There's Arrogance, which Harry edited, which has a lot of us in. And then there's Coping with Len, which was the second Copenhagen video, which Ben edited. So I was just thinking in my own mind of stuff that I had edited, but actually there's more. Um, but to answer that question, it was kind of interesting that... I think other people, I mean, there's obviously a lot of different personalities in DRC and a lot of them quite strong ones. And I think you'd get a different answer from every single person with that. But I think from my own point of view, um, me and Harry skating for Dirtbox, we had a, a very specific drive then suddenly of stuff that we could, it was never, we were never going to make that stuff in replacement of DRC stuff, it was always going to be an addition, but it seemed like at the same time that that was happening, everyone else was starting to disperse a little bit. So it was really, it was perfect for us in scenario to have like a different platform to put it on. Um, and I would still put it under the umbrella of DRC still, because it's yeah. still very DRC, the type of skating in it. Um, but it just gave us, we were both very, very driven by the idea of being represented by Dirtbox. And we were also just very similarly driven in terms of skating. I wouldn't say that our skating is all that similar. I think our idea towards it is similar, but like, I wouldn't say our skating is that similar. But um, our approach to not needing a spot necessarily mm -hmm. is quite aligned. And kind of the work ethic in terms of like, there was never really a bad situation of like, oh, you've been trying for too long. I'm not going to film anymore or that kind of thing. We both knew that like it will come back around at some point to each other. Mm. Um, and I think it was possibly, I can't say from other people's point of view, but it could possibly be also a reason why the dispersive DRC happened a little bit more, especially the people that were still living in Bournemouth because they're like, oh, Scott and Harry's just doing their thing mm. and we're not getting, but it was never that from our point of view. And I'm not saying that people have said that either, but I could see if they were, you know, looking at the disperse of it, like that is possible that that could be viewed that way. But it was never that. It was just more some of the time we lived together. So we were like doing it that way. And, you know, we've got, as much as I have a big bond with everybody from DRC, like we're very, we're pretty close. But me and Harry, especially at that time, were like, we grew up together mm -hmm. and skated together and we had like a, a much closer connection with blading like that for sure. You, I feel like you can see it in the, in the filming and the skating that we kind of just knew like what was up with each other skating for sure. I think so. Yeah. And the, the kind of dispersal has seen, you know, numerous kind of members of the crew really kind of geographically kind of yeah. spread out really as well. Um, you know, which I suppose probably would have happened anyway, you know, I guess, you yeah, know, if you're talking about those sorts of plans that entail, you know, moving continent, um, yeah. you know, then maybe that's, that's what would have happened anyway. Um, so just to kind of have a think about um, some things um, in terms of the introduction of, of Dirtbox um, as a kind of, you, you, you'd mentioned that you were approached um, by Sam and Anthony um, and that had excited you a great deal. Um, so I guess I would say in two, so that was around about the 2017 mark. Is that right? I'm so I'm just, bad with dates, man. I'm going by, uh, I mean, I've done some research, yeah, uh, yeah. but I'm going by, um, you know, kind of dates. On I'll tell you the, what, I could tell you the Vimeos exact date that that and... message was sent on because I still have it. Do, 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 do. As an email? As a Vimeo message. As a Vimeo message, wow. Oh, maybe I don't still have it. Vimeo. Oh, no, I do. It's just the user is called user 1193402 now. Uh, <laughs> that was six years ago. It doesn't say the exact date, so that was six years ago. Wow. Okay. So that was um, 
that was a lot longer than ago than I thought. Yeah. You know, kind of dirt box and, and DRC kind of intersected or or yourself and, and Harry at least had sort of intersected with dirt box. Um, but under dirt box, you released several absolutely stunning videos. Um, so I just wanted to get into a few things. I mean, one of my favorite videos of all time is summer fun. Um, you know, I've like watched that repeatedly. Um, is the title of the video um, an apt description of what making the video was like? Um, there seemed to be an endless stream of interesting and essentially challenging ideas from you and Harry in terms of like the sort of consensus of what tricks are and, and stuff like that. How does spontaneity and fun temper the thirst for conventional tricks such as like hammers and what other people are expecting of you sorry for a long-winded question no, that's cool can i go for a piss first i'm busting for a piss and i, I that's a long I, question that i need to yeah. mm. so i'll answer was it a summer of fun essentially mm. um that's definitely mixed obviously um as we know with skating it's not always uh, especially when you're doing lots of tricks, it's not always just fun. There's definitely some stress and some uh, anxiety and some fear involved, but it was fun for sure. Um, I don't know if Harry will say the same thing. He was definitely going through some confidence and like, it I mean, looking back on it now, I don't feel like anybody would see that in his skating. His skating's incredible in it. And I still don't think he thinks it is at that point, but yeah, I think he it's he possibly wouldn't have found it as fun. But essentially, that video was pretty much filmed in a two-week trip we took around different places. Um, there is some stuff that was filmed outside of that, but not much, really. There's like probably two or three sessions outside of that. But we essentially tried to do it as, like, I took two weeks off of work in the summer and we just spent the time in different hotels around different places and just filmed so it was fun in any sense that like running a marathon would be fun <laughs> I think because essentially like by the third day or whatever like it was a marathon I was rubbing like I had some like uh ibuprofen like gel I was rubbing into my back like before like I've never really done that I've never re really sure. been so struggled with like ongoing injuries or anything but after like five days i was rubbing it into my back before even starting skating because it was already like was was harry not rubbing it in for you <laughs> <laughs> no we were sleeping in the same room and we spent that whole two weeks like literally in each other's pockets like mm. so uh, and considering that was the scenario we, we definitely like handled that and got on pretty well considering that um but yeah like it definitely took a toll on our bodies that there was like there was some days towards the end where we struggled to get through the day because we were also like I was driving us essentially from the hotel to like the center of the city or the town wherever we were mm. and then we were skating from spot to spot literally all day so Difficult. it wasn't like just doing those tricks it was like looking back on it, it literally was like a marathon like every day we, because our goal was to get 10 clips each per day wow so you'd but set I out a numerical yeah. kind of goal yeah I mean it wasn't like oh if we failed that then we failed it wasn't like serious but it was like yeah we would like to get like 10 clips a day each because especially considering like we were kind of I feel like I was almost at my peak at that point and um considering what our skating was like not necessarily needing spots mm. like, it's definitely doable isn't it like going around a completely new place you've never been to before and finding 10 things to do isn't unreachable so that was kind of how we saw it um, and bar, I think maybe like one day, maybe at the end, we did that. Like we definitely did that. So, and it was only because of like it taking a toll on our bodies that we didn't do that towards the end. So it was pretty good, but yeah, um, the name summer fun wasn't named. It was named before we even started filming because I found a Frisbee in my garden in a shared house I lived in, in Bournemouth. It was a yellow Frisbee and it had summer fun written on it in the logo that I ended up using. Actually, I redrew it, but like that's where the name come from. We just thought it was funny. It was pretty dirt box at the time, just mm -hmm. like finding something and repurposing it. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, it was just summer fun. Like, because it was just kind of ridiculous. I found it in my garden in the seaside town. It's like, and I suppose that, like, um, you know, the 
you've been in and around seaside towns pretty much most of your life so that sort of cheesy seaside british exactly. kind of um fabric is just you know yeah. interwoven yeah yeah for, for sure. you i guess so um yeah and as you say it's 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 pretty dirt box so you you see the frisbee and did you would you have suggested to harry um hey look i've, I've kind of got the idea for this marathon we're about to do or when did you agree upon this idea of this two-week hotel sort of trip um where did you go first of all i'd say about the name like so i took a picture of the frisbee and chucked it into the the dirt box group which was just me harry and sam at the time it wasn't the dirt box group but that was our conversational group mm. and then i think it was sam that was like that'll be a sick name for a video like that's definitely sam's vision there um I think we decided to do the trip. I don't know. I think it came about just talking about it being a cool idea to go to like somewhere like Milton Keynes, which was rinsed back in the day mm -hmm. and try and like skate it in a different way to it was like, you haven't seen much from Milton Keynes in, in recent years back then. Mm -hmm. And we thought like just going back on that turf and just trying to use it in a different way to what it would have been, which is why there's kind of that section in the middle to the big pun tune, which is kind of flipping that on its head a little bit, um, which did cause a little bit of controversy, which is interesting, which it never meant to, but. Could you, um, well, I suppose that does actually um, relate pretty directly to the question in the yeah. sense of the sort of, um, there are people who um, may be expecting or would like to see um, a more conventional expression of skating, mm -hmm. I guess, um, from a past era. So yeah. is that the sort of big pun inclusion sort of? Yeah, sort of. I mean, you, we guys, were... you guys looked a little bit different in that segment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we were in Mitwin Keynes and I just thought... That was my idea to have a section in the middle that was just like, I don't know, a throwback. Because we had the high eight. I had some like basketball shorts with me and we were in Milton Keynes. And just to do some like filming that was like iconic from them, like, you know, fisheye from above. And, fish eye from above. And yeah. just like ridiculous, like zooming into the fisheye after the trick to like add a transition like that. Yeah. So, yeah, just trying to like, I don't know. We weren't really trying to say too much of it, to be honest. It was more just like, we're a Milton Keynes, the kind of jokes. Like, how we... how are you aware of um, there being like a, a prickly response to that part of the video? I thought it was so obvious that it was a joke that I, w I couldn't see the prickly response. Like, I, do, I wasn't expecting people to be like, Harry's gone to that spot and done a top sole on it, thinking it's incredible when people back in the day, like yourself, did like true top soles on it. It's like, yeah, that's kind of not what we're trying to do here <laughs> yeah it wasn't like harry didn't go i mean actually to be completely honest we both got there and was like this ledge is quite gnarly actually and doing it like he did the top sole like the the scream that i do is like an, an overreaction it's like <laughs> but at the same time we were like you know he's done it we did it yeah like, it's a drop ledge yeah, it's, it's, it's a fucking drop ledge it's a yeah. yeah you can't you can't um you know overstate um you know the kind of stakes or the skill that's needed to like no. just navigate a job i mean yeah there's by, by no means harry was trying to do his best trick he ever could on there because he could do better tricks than the top sole but that's again isn't really the skating that we do we don't go to a spot and be like hmm what's the best trick we can do on this obstacle mm -hmm. that's not what we're trying to do so that is i think that's kind of part of what we were doing but also part of why i feel like it's like if you've watched the rest of the video then you wouldn't think that Harry was trying to do the best trick that he could do on that ledge. Like that's not the point that was trying to be made. So really, yeah, that's why I was surprised that there was like, like you said, a prickly response. Cause it's like, did you what, like to get to this point in the video, which is quite far in, how are you missing the point? So you, you've, re you've already taken on some, um, you know, some pretty interesting way ways of, of skating yeah. at this point. Yeah, we're not going to rails and like doing, trying to do the best tricks down them. Was it your sense that there was a reaction from that particular part of the video? Yeah, you know, like, but I, <laughs> I mean, it got blown out of proportion because Harry did like response videos and stuff, you know. So it, did he? 
Did you not see any of that? I don't think so. No. Oh, no, it was really good. So what happened was, is that the video went up and then there was a discussion on BMAG message board about it. And then Harry was in the middle of doing his like, I don't know if you ever saw, like he was doing like vlog based stuff. I have seen some of his vlog stuff, but I never kind of followed it chronologically. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. But he was in like that kind of space at that moment, yeah. like making stuff like that. So he was in that character because that's not him either. Like if you know Harry, like most of those vlogs are like maybe a little bit of him in there, but like a very exaggerated, like British com- comedy version. So maybe yeah. like people that aren't British won't even get the fact that he's being completely sarcastic and like yeah. over the top. But um it, what it wasn't even it was British people that were getting hurt by it, actually to be fair but um so he responded so he basically did a video just recording himself on his phone reading the BMAG post and like responding to the reactions that's amazing okay and then I think he did a response to the response I think I can't remember but yeah so it, it became a little bit heated between him and a specific person which I don't, there's no point in naming but like sure. yeah it's just it's just funny because it's just like I don't know if they truly were thinking that Harry was being Harry in that video, then they've probably got every right to be like, what a knob because he was just being <laughs> an exaggerated, ridiculous version of like someone reading comments about themselves. Like, cause a lot of people like read it or watched it and was like, Oh, this guy's got really like, he hasn't got thick skin. It's like, he's joking, you know, like <laughs> it's yeah. fine. But then also on top of that, the idea of missing the point of that middle section, like that wasn't a serious bit of section, was it? You could tell by the way it was filmed, the music that was used, the area that we're in, the tricks that we were doing. Like I did like a like a Mizu to forward. Like it's just yeah, it's wild jokes. It's just obvious what that is, isn't it? I think. So yeah, I don't know. I, I, it's just a, a funny idea that I had to put in the middle of the video, and I think it did break it up quite nicely. Just add a lot, a bit of breathing room in like what is quite a dense video of tricks. It is. Yeah, it is. It's a dense, it's a dense video. It's actually like, um, it's a fairly long video for just two people. And as mm-hmm. you've said, the the marathon aspect of it um, makes sense in that you were aiming for 10 tricks each a day, which I suppose um, reduces the capacity to, you know, like take overt damage on maybe more um, agreed upon range of tricks like mm-hmm. handrails down ledges and and you know that that sort of thing um w- there's there's a long part um in the middle it's it's this really beautiful psychedelic um rock song mm-hmm. um i suppose what i was going to say is that the the video is is it's it's long it's just the two of you um it's quite it has substance it has depth it does make me want to you know um watch it again and again and again there are some quite um how should you say it um sort of trippy kind of effects that kind of um you know play with your 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 sense of perspective with Mm -hmm. I, i don't know would you say anything like that you know in terms of use of effects in that um in that video and so that's kind of like a a throwback to how we did with drc as well me and harry have always kind of done that as we've edited like half of stuff each or like even with the vps like vpo3 for example we did like what we you know that game that you call consequences i don't know if everyone calls it consequences where you like someone draws the head of a person and you fold the paper over and you just have the neck and then the next person draws the body or whatever uh i've heard of yeah i kind of i've heard of that yeah and you can do that with stories as well where you like fold over and you're like so and so met so and so and then you do the next yeah it kind of yeah. becomes this disjointed story but it's kind of interesting I like that's kind of how we did those first like vps because me and harry wanted to, both wanted to edit it so i would like i remember the f- very first one we did i was in my room and i'd made the first i don't know five minutes and then would put all the clips that i used into a folder like of used and then harry could then go and like edit the next five minutes without looking at the previous five minutes mm. and we would try and we'd do it like that so it was kind of a little bit disjointed but at the same time just gets a little bit of like a mixture of flavors in there as well which we kind of did with some of fun i edited the first half so the first like 10 minutes and then the big pun bit then harry did the rest so in terms of psychedelic kind of things there's a lot of uh he did some animation in the first bit of his right where you've got the squares that are like spinning Mm -hmm. and i know that he was influenced by a particular artist at that point but i can't remember who it was i can't remember the name Mm. um but he was, yeah, he was inspired by someone like that. So I don't, I, I don't, 
know what his vision was for that, to be honest, because that was his bit of editing. But in terms of my bit, there was definitely some like playing with colour to do with the sound, especially in that psychedelic bit that you mentioned. Yeah. There was definitely some like mixture of hues and stuff in mm-hmm. when the kind of song was doing that. Um, and just some some quite simple animation as well, actually. But I think you can create some quite nice effects just with like the fuzz of the VHS camera and stuff. Like, I mean, that's a big part of that video, isn't it? Like the mixture, it didn't really come across as potent as I thought it might because I basically used my HVX on that. And what we wanted to do was use SD, Hi8 and HD together. And because the VX also has a tape deck, that was perfect to use because we could use both. And I wanted to use the HD very like, like sporadic throughout, but it to be really like, it basically be an SD video, mm. but then little bits of like clarity that come through when you mm. use the HD. Mm. But it wasn't really as apparent because the like the tape deck on the HVX is so good anyway. The quality, the shift in quality wasn't as drastic as I was hoping for it to be. Mm. Um, but I th- I still think it has a nice element of like mixing tech textures together and things like that like it still works fairly well but not as i was i was picturing like fuzziness and then like really clear hd in between but the difference between an sd camera and 720p is not really that drastic yeah i was gonna i mean i was gonna ask you uh, i mean i had something sort of noted down to directly ask you about the sort of discrepancy between those two formats and i suppose Mm. like most of the action as you say uh, at least like sort of fisheye action and you know the formal kind of moves I guess uh, are captured on HD camcorders and mm-hmm. there's an alternation between the two formats of standard definition and HD and you've just described that a little bit but could you differentiate in more detail between these two formats maybe speak to how they emphasize each other or what each of them sort of trying to convey yeah so I mean <clears throat> It was kind of a weird choice for me to buy a HVX when I did actually, because we were very into filming with like tape cameras at that point and it being, and we'd film kind of overexposed on purpose as well. It's kind of like what we were going for a little bit. Like you can't see completely what's going on. Mm. Do you know what I mean? That, that's people like Mike and that coming in, you know, he has some wild ideas where you're just like, you want people to not be able to see the skating. That's what you want. <laughs> But like those kind of ideas are definitely like, you know, if you bring them back slightly, it is quite interesting to, again, for rewatch as well. If you're struggling to see something, you're going to go back and want to watch it again, especially if like the rest of the skating around it is worth seeing. Um, But I mean, I I do think that the HVX is one of the best cameras to film skating with and like the fisheye just works so well with it. But I really do like the texture of those older cameras. Like it brings something, especially like, I don't know if it's because I've grown up on the seaside and that kind of stuff, but like the seaside footage with the film, like grain and the camera and like the, you know, the shift sometimes if it kind of goes wrong, that there's something about that, those colours, the blues and the yellows on the film. It just, I don't know, for for that kind of footage, I think it works really well. And I just, I think having some texture and some not forced glitching but like some like camera malfunction in there just adds a bit of texture and a bit of I don't know a bit of something that the HD camera can't give like there's only a few videos that I've done that are literally full HD without putting a bit of Mm. something else in there Um, and it is doable I think like keeping it interesting obviously but for me, like the style that I like to do, <clears throat> it's almost like collage you know, just like adding, la- and like you said, like layering stuff up, it's much easier to do that with a few different textures. Just layering lots of HD videos on top of each other doesn't really give you any kind of depth or anything extra, but layering like different formats together definitely does. There's something about- <clears throat> I've like- never really messed with the, the Super 8, which like, you know, size more and people like that do, which is quite nice, but. Because when you watch like a a Super 8 um, piece of film included in like a skate section, I suppose for me, one of the things is this um, sort of sense of timelessness of like reticence, like looking back in neither a positive nor negative way, but that there's just just been depth to this whole thing. And it sort of 
conveys that aspect of like the overall story of like creating film living life skating being part of that life this is what we're focusing on right now yeah um and the, i suppose yeah there's something you know often you hear the word nostalgic nostalgia the sort of um value and celebration of the kind of of the past of the good times of the past um is that does that sort of yeah, relate yeah, to sure. you in terms of standard definition and yeah that? and for sure like i mean it was the basis of like everything drc and i definitely do represent that within my skating every time i put on my skate so like to use that definitely does just feed back into that and dirt box essentially was a quite a similar aesthetic as well so yeah i think it's just a kind of throwback and it's like i don't know that's what all my skating's always been represented with so it just it makes sense with the skating to do that and i suppose like video clips um or tricks moves when you're doing them you seek to do them flawlessly um with a degree of you know perfection you know when it's complete we you know there's a process that's at play there to like complete the move and it's done flawlessly perfectly and with introducing sort of glitched layers um, mm -hmm. of the footage, um, you know, you're sort of almost introducing this kind of corruption, this degraded sure. kind of, you know, it's a flaw, I suppose, yeah. um, that you're sort of bringing out. Um, is that, why is that interesting, you know, as, as a layer? Um, yeah. In terms of like the, the flawlessness of a move or what it's supposed to be yeah um, maybe it enhances the flaw flawlessness of the move because everything else is kind of not flawless that's kind of interesting i never thought of it that way but that does make a lot of sense that you're trying to enhance how well performed something is mm. by degrading something else around it because everything else around it is like usually the spots are kind of gross and like degraded mm -hmm. anyway so that makes a lot of sense would you would you also say that um I mean, you were just talking about some of Mike's ideas, um, you know, like, for instance, having like an overly exposed image. Uh, I always thought that there's something about leaving something to your own imagination to sort of fill in the blanks. And mm -hmm. I think with standard definition, it's sort of, um, yeah, I suppose it forces that that way of thinking or filling in the blanks and interpreting the image in a more imaginative kind of way is yeah. that do you, does that make sense to you yeah yeah that makes sense of... as well um there's definitely times that i've done that as well where you like cut a clip early but leave the audio and that kind of leaving something to fill in like i wonder what happened there and i think yeah that's definitely an element that i put into videos as well like it's hard to do with skating because you do it's very visual isn't it and you do want to be able mm -hmm. to see the trick so you can't do that to a certain degree, I always try and do that with like effects or degradedness that I try and put on clips as well. It's kind of leave the actual trick, like you can't mess with that too much because that's already like, oh, I don't want to sound, I don't want to sound lame, but like it's already like that's the piece in itself. You don't mm -hmm. need to mess mm -hmm. with that bit. Mm -hmm. So I always try and keep that to the run ups and the landings and the stuff in between. Like every now and again, you could do something to it, but I don't know. There's been videos in the past I've seen that like, you know, that those kind of effects carry on throughout the trick and you're just like that doesn't you don't need to do that uh, you don't need to ruin the trick so yeah i've always been quite careful with that too and like cuts as well cutting in the right place is quite difficult isn't it like getting that right between a long and a fish eye or between two longs or whatever mm. getting that cut in the right place is difficult i think yeah you were talking about that cut um in big wheels too for leon basin mm. you know with the kicks yeah and yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a kind of developed um, sense of getting a, a cut right. And there are, I suppose, different gestures, bodily pieces of action, textures, the sky. I don't know. It's actually quite a lot of different factors that yeah. that maybe um, create a, an obvious cut or a viable cut. Um, just, so just thinking about, um, you know, like your skating, you know, we sort of focused on on some editing stuff and some, you know, visual stuff. Um, something that strikes me about the way that you skate um, is this kind of idea of faint definition that you seem to convey. Um, you can always find uh, a space for your skate to fit 
latch on to or slide across, it seems. In Strangers Like You, um, you epitomize this idea, um, straight airing a set of stairs with your feet sort of latched underneath uh, the rail, um, creating the impression of an undergrind in a way. So it's like the faintest of definition, you know. Um, is it important to you to interpret space with these fine margins to operate within? Yeah, I mean, that idea, yeah, I, yeah, I do. Um, slotting the foot into something is is really interesting, actually, because like um, the one that I think of is the the grind on the D lock, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and that idea I've had for quite a long time, and I think it came from like Ollie Short does something with the D lock. He doesn't do the same thing, but he does a trick where he like kicks one or something, and it made me think about like actually using one to grind like the way that I did. Um, and for a long time, I would every now and again see a spot that it was possible on, but my foot wouldn't fit in the D-lock. You need the right D-lock. You need the right yeah. D-lock at the right yeah. spot. And then that one that we came across, I was like, no way my foot fits in it. And like that, like that is perfect because actually the spots that I saw before like that's going over like quite a few years as well. That trick, like it's rare that I have a trick in my head that I have to wait for the right spot to do. Mm -hmm. But that one was, it was just kind of like just sitting in there. And yeah, the, there's previous spots that I had the idea that possibly would have worked on them if my foot fit in, they wouldn't have been as good as the one that I did it on. So it's kind of like the fact that my feet didn't fit in that is good, helpful, came at the right time, came in the right video as well. It makes sense that it was in that video. Um, but yeah, like, I think that is important finding those kind of things because that, I remember when I posted that, I don't know if I was, I'm the only person to do that. Like it's probably been done before somewhere else, but I've not seen it. But like, I remember a lot of comments were like, how has nobody thought to do that? Yeah. And it's like, yeah, that's, that's, they're the kind of tricks that I'd like to do. You know, it's the same in the design world. Like when someone comes up with a logo or something, it's been like, yeah, that's the obvious answer to that. Or like, why has that not been thought of before? Mm. And yeah, that's the kind of thing that I kind of, at that point in time, especially was striving to do like. So, so just to zoom out a little bit, is that like an overarching sort of principle? And I think we, we've kind of spoken about this before, this, this idea of you're watching somebody do something and you're like, of course I could do that. You mm -hmm. know, like that's an understandable, agreed upon idea, a viable way to move, to do mm -hmm. something. But I could have done that, but I didn't yeah. because it's outside of that vernacular, that that vocabulary that, you know, that we're sort of used to. So by very virtue of what you're doing, you're sort of coming out of that, but doing this thing that other people could have done, but they're not doing. Yeah. Yeah, it's perfect. That's like people like if people watch my skate and say, I wish I thought of that. That's like, yeah, perfect. That's what you want from it. If they say. I wish I thought of that but I wouldn't have been able to do that even if I did think of it. It's like, that's the, that's, that's the, like the top level of what I would be trying to do. Um, I don't think my skills are like, you know, like if, if my ideas are in the, in the hands of someone like Aragon, that would unlock another level of like, okay, if I thought to do that, I could do that. Do you know what I mean? But my, my kind of ideas have to be in the level of my own skill and the mm. arsenal of tricks that I can do. So that only kind of sits slightly above, like you're probably only going to have 10% of tricks that are like that, that like, I wish I thought of that. And if I thought of it, I wouldn't be able to do it because of one, my ideas and two, the skill levels are only to a certain point. But like, I don't know. I've never thought it with Eugen before, but his last edit, he's had a few in there where it's just like, I'd never have thought to do that. Mm. Mainly because I just like, my skill level is not high enough to even consider that I would be able to do that. That one where he does like alley fish and then, yeah, the drop negative. negative with the same grabbed foot like what? yeah what it, it's like uh tricks mad it's like um well look i think you probably more than most people have uh, almost visual aversion to that kind of trick based on the kind of um fall or slam you're likely to have if you try that yeah yeah well exactly split. yeah 
Um, and I suppose that's a sort of separate issue onto itself, which, you know, we could touch on or not. It depends if we want to make um, people mind. who are watching this start puking up blood and uh, <laughs> everything else that they might start throwing up. Um, but just to kind of go back to um, what we were just sort of touching on there, I suppose it makes me think like to what extent do movable objects play a part in your building of an idea or movement? At any given spot would you speak to an idea around like activation or like a transfer of energy to an object that moves you know um, hence the the d-lock um idea but i've certainly seen a trend in your skating that you know kind of utilizes that principle of transferring energy to moved objects and you're sort of almost activating a, a sort yeah. of does that I love that um I love anything that's like broke, like a broken thing is cool. Like the idea of like skating street anyway is cool because you're doing, you're doing tricks on things that weren't intended for tricks to be done on them. Mm -hmm. So you're like already using it for something it's not made for, which is cool. But especially if something's broken or like, like, like you said, like moving, like I could, I used the term kinetic tricks right. just as like, it kind of is isn't it it's like it's built up energy that isn't kind of accessible until you hit it it's like and what i really like about that which is quite similar to doing tricks that are kind of you know striving to do tricks that are never been done like mbds is tricky anyway because i've had this conversation with harry a lot of times like let's see say you're trying to do I don't know, a kind grind on something and you're struggling to do it, you know from like years and years of watching people do kind grinds and doing them yourself that, okay, I need my weight to be there more for, for me to be able to like last the length of that grind or I need to go a bit faster because it's sticking a little bit or whatever. But if you're doing tricks that are like essentially haven't been done before, or at least you haven't seen them done before, you don't have those kind of things to like back up on. So you're almost like making the rules as you're doing them, mm. like... And I find that really interesting. It's equally as frustrating as it is fun because you just kind of, sometimes you're doing the same mistake over and over again and you don't know why that's, that's why you're not doing it. But I do really like that idea and like the same with kinetic spots. Like sometimes I found it with certain ones where I would hit it the same, exactly the same way three times and it would react differently all of those three times. So you can't even get into a place where you're building up a rhythm and like, a constant you know flow of the, the way that you're doing it like it just reacts different each time especially like something if you're bouncing on something or anything mm -hmm. like that and that's I've, i do find that interesting it's super frustrating and sometimes you go away not even doing it and you don't even know what you were doing wrong because so i suppose like the physical like the physics slash metrics um are a little bit more skewed in the, in that sort of terrain because as you were yeah. saying like with a kind grind you have got the metrics of you know h block resistance and friction length mm -hmm. of rail gradient of rail material you know like yeah. the, there are these reliable dependable kind of metrics that we've we've spent some time um getting the grips with mm -hmm. um but with these um sorts of um you know like um, activation or kinetic kinds of tricks the metrics are way more skewed unpredictable is yeah. it that um so that that interests you that fascinates you it seems that it's just a, a really quite sophisticated nuanced ocean of skating that's quite microcosmic it's like within a within mm -hmm. kind of thing yeah like, and, it's, and it's just like super challenging like not saying that i'm by any means at a situation where i've completed blading and done all the tricks i could possibly do because i'm definitely not there um especially with things like switch tricks because you know if i if i wanted more of a challenge i could just go and learn like all the tricks on various different obstacles right but i don't know that is it is just a challenge that's i don't know because all of my skating is like at that point in time especially with skating we were only skating and filming we weren't really going skating and not filming because even if we were doing little stuff and messing about it was probably interesting enough to post online anyway because people are interested in the ideas mm -hmm. so we so in terms of like yeah it was kind of exciting to be like oh, i wonder what people how people would react to this idea or to react to that idea because you know it's like a you're gonna have hits and misses they're not all gonna be bangers they're not all gonna be really good ideas some people are gonna watch it and be like what's the hell like sometimes there's tricks where you don't even need skates on to do them like 
like why is that skating um i um you made me think of one in particular and i think um i mean even the closing of the clip you kind of get a sense of like how jokes it was to just do it but i think you like you do a kind of stall like that and then you do a then you spin and it, it's like two walls that are like that and you basically do the splits you pretty much do like a time cop type thing uh, yeah is that then, that's in um the going clear one the one where it's like funny i think color. that's in going clear yeah, yeah. and then yeah, that was jokes and then you just come off and you're like yeah <laughs> i was, mean it just the reason why that made me so happy, it took me a while to do that mainly because you have to concentrate so much on both feet at the same time yeah and i was really getting confused it's kind of that thing that of like tapping your head and rubbing your stomach at the same time you know like concentrating on two like the fundamental coordination issue yeah and i was like twisting and like every time i'd hit one and miss the other and i'd be like oh i can't just because con- hitting it at the same time with both in different because it's, it's different to doing it on one surface they're like two different surfaces and it was really messing with my mind so i thought that was quite an interesting idea but yeah, I mean, in terms of like a trick that's filmed in a skate video, it's kind of like, there's a, there's a few of those though. And I kind of like just chucking the pepper in them in a little bit. And like, like kinetic kind of spots, um, for me, it, it seems to like sometimes be opening something mm-hmm. or like closing something. Um, you know, and th- these are like rails sometimes. Um, so like- Usually you know, more dangerous. Kind of sketch yeah Yeah. like super sketchy um and so there seems to be like a kind of deliberate you know seeking out of this awkwardness and sort of the kinetic awkwardness you know um which which is sort of the stuff that you you most likely pass up that you would most likely um say that's not for for touching you know with skates on you know yeah you, you, so it's what kind it, of i would see it as like <clears throat> it's going to sound again like a bit maybe arrogant but it's not how i mean it but like it's kind of blading for bladers like someone that isn't into skating isn't going to understand why that trick mm. is hard or good or dangerous mm. or anything you have to understand the nuances to know why that's harder than it looks and i think that's that's possible why the skating had the downfall as well, that kind of skating, because people can't just, like, non-bladers can't just look at it and be like, that's wicked, I want to do that. Because mm. they wouldn't. They wouldn't just look at me kicking two walls at the same time and be like, that's wicked, I want to do that. But, I mean... But you, yeah. you don't think that... Um, yeah, I mean, I, I understand that point in the sense of, you know, there's I've definitely seen pushback against that sort of skating. I'm aware that there is pushback of that against that sort of skating um that it's not either real skating that it doesn't pose risks which is not true um that it doesn't like respect the kind of roots and Mm. the the kind of um you know the history um and the established vernacular vocabulary um of skating so i i've definitely you know seen that that sort of pushback um but i really like that idea of you know it's kind of for people who have sort of stuck with and understand you know the terrain that we have at our hands to kind of go and operate in and you know if you don't seek to be limited then that can actually be an incredibly powerful important resource um to you know utilize as your own tool of development and i would certainly say that that's been you know the case for me as like somebody who like you know analyzes loves skating and you know does want to kind of interpret the space and as open as a as a way that i that as i possibly can um you know so i think there's a quite a lot of kind of credit you know to you for that and i don't think it's it's really um you know arrogant to say that at all i think that that's that's actually no. accurate and I, th- I think like only like if you were to just get into skating and try and do that kind of like i don't know how to coin it like a creative skating it would it wouldn't look good and it you would it would be quite it you wouldn't be able to be that creative if you didn't have the tools mm. like th- that skating can only happen if you've you know, spent 10 years at Weymouth Skate Park grinding down these things. Do you know what I mean? Like, 
because you have to have that being comfortable on skates and understanding kind of where you're putting your weight and you know getting to a spot and knowing like what's possible on it you can only know what's possible on it by understanding what you can do yourself trying to like what ability that you have you can't just it wouldn't work if you didn't have an arsenal of tricks like in the foundations of your skating you know so you have to be technically sound and yeah that and that's makes... why i kind of pointed to eugen because like the fact that he's thinking that way now and he's like he's probably got the biggest arsenal of tricks of anyone i've ever seen yeah, so, it's a scary skill set yeah and he's like you know he's got unbelievable like confidence on rails that he seemingly can't get hurt on them and can do whatever he wants on them without it being dangerous so like having that foundation and then the i like building ideas on top of that of like what's possible on skates it's like that's mad like yeah he's he's a bit of a so far he's a bit of a torchbearer in in that in that respect and you know that thread the needle move on the rail as well again it's sort of mixing um you know ideas that were kind of islands on their own really at, at one point yeah. or another and, and now it's it's somehow possible to to do a thread the needle whilst actually grinding with yeah. grabs as well it's um you know that's 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 really quite a, a kind of stunning kind of place to be in to be in or, or to see that kind of thing go down uh th that was really uh you know interesting point about having a rounded technical kind of base now i hear the word technical and creative thrown around just ad nauseum right like it, it the, there's not too many words around that sort of describe the the style or the um the, the type of skating i guess what's mm -hmm. your understanding of the kind of term technical and creative where do they meet and what's the discrepancy between the two sorts of terms in your in your view that's very interesting technical and creative <clears throat> i guess like maybe in like the simplest form you could be like the technical type style of skating or the technical side of it would be more like the athleticness of it and the you know the training and learning all the tricks and then the creative side is like how you kind of use those and how you realize those into the space that you're around. Um, but like I said, you can't have one without the other. Like my favorite, I mean, I don't only like creative skating, like people would be surprised that like Brian Aragon, like massive, like his ego sections, like so good. And that's only because of just like, I really like seeing someone be able to do something so well that it just looks like not a problem for them. Mm -hmm. Like his front five on that roof, 540 off at the start of Ego. Beautiful. Like that landing, you don't really see, you, you can't do that without like years and years and years of just like, tr like pra training essentially, I guess. But it's just so good to see that. So I think my, my favorite type of skating is to like, add that creativeness with a high technical ability in there as well so you could like if you wanted to in a line of doing something mad creative like i can't even like come come up with a trick because you need a spot essentially first to be able to come up with a trick but like then being able to throw in a full cab true soul uh, on something at the like, in the same line or like a full cab true fish and you can't it's rare that you get the people that can do both of those things but when you do like that's amazing like i don't i don't dislike grinds i don't dislike anti-rockers like i skate anti-rockers now like but i think people get a skewed kind of vision of people especially if they're like new to being back into skating that classic like blade that's been out for 10 years and they come back and they look and they're like well he's not jumping downstairs or anything it's like well you can watch some of my old sections if you want i have done that like i've done some horrible rails and i've done some like rail tricks and that's I feel like that's why that I can go back and do, you need to know the rules to be able to break them, right? That's kind of the thing with everything, isn't it? So like, 100%. I've learned the rules, I've learned how to do stuff properly, come out fakey, hold hold the fakey, do you know what I mean? Hold the grab, like whatever. Uh, and that's why you can now go back and be like, okay, I can do it that way. That's why when like, I guess when Broscow did the 
the backslide and forward out with no grab and everyone was like oh right that's like the new the new thing now isn't it like we don't have to grab it and we can come out forwards and he could only do that because you know that he could do it the other way a million mm. times if he wanted to i think it's that kind of the ability to show that and that's why like a, a no grab forward out is great because you can show like i could be grabbing it now but i'm choosing not to Mm. And like forcing the forward like is, is another element of control yeah so um going against the grain um mm. rewinding coming out forwards having a kind of control of your hips and your yeah. posture and your body position um being composed having... in like a scenario where you're like going fast down a set of stairs on top of a rail and you're just looking like it's the most calm thing in the world like you've mapped out that situation yeah. that terror that that terrain that you know yeah so having a well-performed you know smooth competent um control of all things that are going on um speaks to kind of you know having a, a very sound technical base and i suppose the creative impetus or intuition to demonstrate it on the space is the is the creative kind of element of it you know and mm. yeah i just sorry i just hear um you know so and so is very technical or that that's very very technical yeah. or he's like a you know or she's like a creative type person and it's more creative and it's technical and, and i always think of technique um and technique being this like quite subtle implementation you know based on what you know of the the sort of physics the terrain of yourself of your body um mm. with that sound kind of base of experience of doing you know the kind of language the grinds the vernacular yeah. that kind of stuff but you know I, I i just always think about that kind of stuff really yeah. in terms of what what am i doing here is this technique based or am i like outside of the box here because i try and like not bite off things where it's like I think I might eat shit here. Like I'm, I'm trying to go with quite high percentages in terms yeah. of what I'm doing. Um, and I suppose I mean, Harry that we always spoke about that. You want low impact, high reward. Yeah, that's what you're looking for, isn't it? Kind of, yeah. Low danger, um, low impact, high reward. That's the best trick that you can find. I think so. I mean, and and you always, uh, you know, when you've got one, and you get a lot of like. Um, you get a lot of thrust from that especially if it's early on in a day where you know you might be out skating with you know a few of the homies and you know maybe it's an early day in spring and you know the ideas are all you know popping off in terms of how things are going to go over the mid medium to longer term yeah. you know future and you just get um you know low impact easy you know reward kind of trick that allows you to demonstrate all of that stuff and looks awesome and it's like you know that'll get you going yeah and, that, yeah. That, and, and that, sometimes that you can get multiple out of that one idea like if you if you think of an idea that's like low impact high reward sometimes you could be like if i do that backwards or i do it one footed i can use both the two footed one and the one footed one i've got two out of this like low impact high reward idea because there's something about looking precarious i suppose looking precarious but you know embodying calmness and control yeah but, control like, and composure is ultimate for me i think you can do whatever trick you want if you look like you know it's like those things where like before you've even done the 180 degree turn and landed you already like you've already landed you can see that in your head you've mm. already got it like those things i love that like that that amount of control and that's like you get that with roscow don't you? you like you know he's landed it really solid before he's even touched the floor yeah yeah it's that's uh, great yeah it just communicate something like so consummate and the sort of um the ideal sum of what of what we want to see on on skates yeah. and you know he he embodies it every time he exactly. goes out Those there people that are like well i could do that it's like yeah but you couldn't do it like that like, that's yeah. the difference isn't it that's like you couldn't do it like that yeah there's there's actually you know there's so much to to kind of give um alex brosco credit for really and just in terms of the the absolute risk that he has taken in his life to to yeah. kind of develop the craft into those kind of terrains because i suppose his like you know his his kind of like creative technical vision sort of metric just all of the metrics that 
result in him skating the way that he does, you know, internally just must be like, he's got just this huge, huge circumference and area yeah. of, of skill and just knowing and control and just physical awareness, like um, awareness of the physics of the metrics yeah. of the, the biting points of wheels. And, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like just, creator character stats are all like maxed out, right? They're all at the top. Yeah, he's a bit, you know, he's a bit sort of Messi slash Ronaldo yeah, type yeah. vibes, you know. It's just sort of, um, you know, he's just um, a real phenom. Um, yeah. You know, we could just go off on some brosky <laughs> tangent. Um, but I wanted to just come back to um, Strangers Like You for a second. Um, just because, uh, you know, we'd sort of been talking about kinetic trips, uh, tricks um, and then we just sort of like wandered off down that direction for a bit, which is like super interesting, exactly why I wanted to talk to you and, and kind of get some of those ideas out there because I find it really, really fascinating. Um, Strangers Like You um, has a sort of clear kind of concept derived from the Charlie Brooker show, Black Mirror. Um, I suppose, like, given the troubling nature of themes in Black Mirror, would you say something about the choice to align with the show? And I suppose with a view to some of the changes in culture and sort of social media and how we use these sorts of tools at this point in time and just a sense of, like, the world as it is in this moment, you know? Mm. Um, <clears throat> the reason why I went down the Black Mirror route with it is because... So the song in the section is made by Sam Curry's brother. He's like, he produces and raps music. And I did, I knew about him through Sam and was like, do you think that he would be able to, has he got any tunes that I could use? Or like, cause we were also talking about copyright at that point, because at that point in time, music was being stripped out of videos and like videos were getting taken down because of like copyright. So we were like, if we can own something from the start of it, like all of the video, then that's cool. Um, so I talked to Sam and his brother about it and his brother was like super down and what was really appealing to me at the time was that I would be able to have full control over the amount of like bars of rapping that I'd be able to have in it and the amount of music that I'd have in it so I said to him he basically had bars that he was going to put over a beat for me and he had a beat um which he made specifically for the section. He saw some footage and was like, oh, I'll make a beat. And then he sent me the first one across and I was like, oh, I'd like a little bit more in it. It was quite like samey throughout. And then he kind of like, as you know, that kind of song definitely dips in and out of like mm. different kind of song, uh, kind of like themes, I guess. And he basically made a, a seven minute beat for me to edit to, and then gave me, I think three verses, which I could put anywhere over it so because i i know from editing i usually like editing over instrumentals because you don't have to then like weave in and out of like the the rapping or the singing mm. but i did know that i wanted some rapping in it because sometimes it's nice to have those bits where you don't have like some potent skate sounds that all kind of come within so you can just have bits that fill it so like he gave me those bits that I could put wherever I wanted so it gave me complete freedom with my edit of being able to like flow it however I wanted to and then I didn't know what kind of lyrics he was going to choose or anything there was no in like, I didn't have any impact on like what um he was going to rap about or whatever but it was quite political I guess which kind of made me kind of sent me down the route of that Black Mirror I was watching a lot of Black Mirror at the time mm. and that one that episode with the likes you know that Mm -hmm. where she then can't get in a taxi because she hasn't got enough and the social credit score right um, you have to like earn your credits in society yeah. kind of thing yeah so which like... as we know isn't like a million miles away from where we're at anyway but um it made me think about that within skating and how like especially the type of skating that i was exploring and trying to do like if it's not seen as cool then it just like people won't watch it and kind of like also the inner ring of skating and I don't know if I really feel the same way about it now, but like, if you're cool, then you're cool and people will watch it and say it's good before even, like I've definitely seen that before where people have been like, I already love this and I haven't even watched it yet. And it's like, just because of the name, like I get that. Um, but it wasn't even like, oh, I'm sat outside of this kind of inner circle and I hate it. It wasn't like a, a commentary on that necessarily. It's just more like, 
I guess I'm kind of in it at some points and I kind of see it. It's just kind of like a, a mention of like what was going on. So that's why I had the sound bites, which were actually from a different episode. Yeah. Um, the, yeah. There was a few episodes mixed few in. A few episodes like spliced consistent. in there. Yeah. Yeah. But I kind of like the idea of like that guy being blocked out as well, right? From the from the episode, I think it's White Christmas, it's called, where. But the sort of censored outlines. Yeah, sort which of... Is, I thought was a really cool idea. Um, but the main overarching idea was more of like, you know, there's some sound bites in there where he's like, don't try too hard. It's impossible to respect. And it's like, in terms of blading, I think that's really cool too, because like people just like doing Hurricane Top Souls and 720 like cab 720 kind grinds and stuff like people are like i literally don't care that's <laughs> yeah. like yeah, yeah. I, I don't know i just thought it was an interesting like there's definitely a few different ideas that are weaved throughout it in those like quotes and things which are just like and at the same time as where he's saying don't try too hard it's impossible to respect i'm like jumping off of a roof onto another thing and then off of that so i try to align the tricks to like what he's saying at that point as well um but I'm definitely not like making a dig at that type of skating because I've always loved to like jump off roofs and mm. cliffs and grind down gnarly kink rails. Like I love all types of skating. So it's definitely not a commentary on like, this is the way that I like to skate and everything else is I'm taking the piss out of. It wasn't really that. It was just more like, I'm just viewing it. But there's also a bit in there as well, like to circle it back around to the point of Harry and his video commentary on the comments on the BMAG forums. There's a bit in there where... He says, how do you like your toast? And the kind of visual yeah. I had of that is like, do you like the creative side or do you like the technical side? And like, I put some blades on the woman when she's in there. And then suddenly there's like a cut to like them in like a, an office almost. And they all look at the camera and there's a BMAG logo behind. Oh, jokes. And I just Amazing. knew that that would like cause a little spark conversation in the BMAG forum, which it did because someone commented, like screenshotted it and put, oh, come on, guys, who's up upset Harry again? Or something. <laughs> like, it was, it was perfect, because I just wanted, like, it wasn't necessarily towards Harry. It was just more like the forums are going to talk about, like, the creative skating versus the technical skating, which is, you know, just thought it was interesting. So there is a lot of ideas weaved in there, but there isn't one consistent of, like, this is what I'm trying to say. It was just more like as I was editing and as I was doing more stuff. Um, and also it gives you, like making an edit like that it gave me a theme to work off as well i guess mm -hmm. i don't really want to use the word theme because it wasn't a black mirror theme but like it gave me like visuals and just like things that i could tie into the whole video i guess yeah that that's that makes um an awful lot of sense and i suppose it kind of continues um your association association with i, I suppose the tv British TV pop culture, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and that's, yeah, that's, um, that's really interesting how you've interwoven um, or spliced in sound um, quotes um, that kind of speak to a kind of broader discussion about what skating is that then you sort of almost continued as an in-joke with the edit so there's yeah. that in, there's a kind of interaction challenging it's very challenging to the audience um, mm. but not in a direct way like you know if you don't think or like i or do what i do um you know we we've, we've got a problem um mm. at all um the 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 black mirror sort of idea or um aesthetic obviously that show went on for for quite a few seasons and you know how do the changes within culture that are sort of synthesized in a show like black mirror how does that you know how does that change the way that you you see skating or your role in skating and you know and if that's too broad sweeping of a question mm. I don't know if I at the moment I'm not very active in skating so I don't know if, you know, if I have a role or like a I don't think I can even really make a particular comment on it i definitely feel strongly about like i've always thought that if if you're going to moan about skating and that it's missing something or like someone's not doing something good enough then you've got to fill that void yourself do you know what i mean if i'm saying that the whatever if i'm saying there's something missing in skating i should definitely go out there and do it if i if i don't think it's there um so at the moment since i'm not really putting out anything i don't think i can have too much of a comment um but in terms of the way it's going, it's very interesting how Big Wheel is kind of almost 
kind of eclipsing like smaller wheeled blading i guess and like the fact that i I'm, i mean i guess that won't even be a term soon like big wheeling in comparison to small wheeling like it'll just be skating well it is just skating isn't it but like that's kind of where i'm at yeah like I, i'm just putting on some skates and doing a particular skating. trick in those skates i've never really done too much big wheeling to be honest i've had some but um I don't know i just feel like all the tricks that i tend to do i can do on skates that i have i don't know I, it's a weird one i'm not really one to go out and skate on my own and i think if i was to do that i would do it on big wheels because then you can just go and cruise the streets or whatever but that's not i don't know i don't know why that's something that i've never really considered too hard yeah do you um see skating um as a route to you know increase heart rate uh, to perspire to attain fitness um is there a kind of non-aggressive non you know sort of creative technical in the context that we've just been described discussing yeah would you go out to, for your heart rate keep fit do you do stuff like that no really? i've never really done skating for fitness if anything, I'd say that the type of skating that I've always done is never really like, it's kind of anti, like good for your body. <laughs> if ever like, you know, a few years ago, I was like playing football alongside doing skating and it's like, they definitely don't work together. It's hard. It's hard. It doesn't like, I definitely couldn't say that it's like, oh yeah, I'm going out skating today, which is sort of like training. I, I mean, I definitely don't do it as cardio with skating. If you're knackered, you can just stop for a bit. Like, I don't, yeah, I've never really done it for fitness. I would say that it has kept me fitter up until this point because I've noticed where I've been doing it less. Definitely like, yeah, my stamina and stuff is not as good. But that kind of disappears though when as soon as you're doing a trick that you're passionate about and that you're focused on, you don't even notice you're knackered until after you've done it and then you realise how exhausted you are. Do you part of why it's taken so long to do because you're knackered and you're still trying but um yeah that's something that i noticed because i've been going out and taking photos with cooper lately mm. and that's the only time i've been going out skating and i'm obviously doing tricks that are tricky because i'm trying to get photos so that's something that i definitely noticed that i'm unfit at the moment but i don't really care or notice until the trick's done and then you're like right i am fucked now <laughs> so does that um bring about a sense of your kind of experience and age and you know does it bring your awareness to where you're at in terms of your skating career and how long you've got left to do what you're doing mm. um in terms of that that those bodily kind of pains aches sensations and this sort of idea that you're not fit yeah they go away though don't they like once you like if i was to skate a couple times in a week or multiple times in a month which i'm definitely not doing at the moment i think those things will go away even like i know it's falling and my palms hurting much more than usual but it's just like not being used to it like not having that pain mm -hmm. like not being used to getting in the shower and it's stinging like that's not a very nice feeling okay. for me now to not have the stinging because it's like quite obvious that i've not been skating enough you know um so i think those things will come back and the idea of like going out skating a lot and like those aches they'll be there for sure. Like my groins ache after I skate, yeah. but like groins, do you have two groins? Because you have one each side. I think it's something that we say, but it's just definitely a groin. I yeah. say groins as well. Groins. Cause you've got your left groin and your right groin. You definitely. I got two, <laughs> one, two, <Here> my groins. <laughs> yeah. My groin definitely aches after skating. And I just, I know that that would go away and, the the passion for the tricks that i'd be doing especially if i was filming or something would definitely get me through mm. that pain or ache or whatever i was going through enough to like get through that and then if i was aching the next day at work i don't really care so i, I know that will be there but I, i'm not bothered about it the the passion um to get through um whatever adversity you're in doing that that move um, you just mentioned shooting photographs of Sam, and I know that we've spoken a little bit about the the kind of contrast between shooting a photograph and shooting a video clip. Um, could you say a little something um, about what is what you're trying to achieve with the kind of photograph, um, you know, and 
the, the sort of passion that drives you to complete a photograph, does that differ in any way from the, the passion mm. to complete a moving image? It's so, di I didn't uh, imagine how different it would be actually. It was shocking to me how different it is. And mainly because <clears throat> if you do a clip for a video and it's being filmed, then as soon as you land it the way you want, that's that. Like, even if the filmers kind of messed it up a little bit, they're definitely going to get it the next go. Like, it's rare that you'd, like, land something, stomp it and be like, that was it, and you mm. have to do it again. But with a photo, the amount of times that I did it, and in my head I was like, that was perfect, that was it. You come back and look at the photo and you're like, huh, in that, like, split second, I was not in a good position. But the mm. overall movement was, like, felt spot on, mm. which is weird, and I'd never, you know, like, it takes it takes certain body positions completely out of context, which I've never really thought before. But like, if I'm doing a trick on a video and my arm goes like that, and then it comes back around to like counteract that balance or the movement I was doing, it makes complete sense in the moment. Mm -hmm. But if like in a photo, your arms over here, it's like, what? Like, that doesn't make any sense to like the rest of the body position that you're in. So it makes complete sense to why it's so different, but I'd never really thought about it before. And my arms were something that I've never really considered. Like there's definitely like nuances in my skating that I notice in clips that I try and eradicate, but my arms were never really something that I was that concerned with. They're obviously very long. I'm a very long guy mm -hmm. and like, but maybe like the, the point three fisheye from down low, like my arms are so far away and so small by that point, it doesn't really matter. I don't know, but like, in the photos, every photo that Sam would take, he'd be happy with it. And I'd be like, my arms look ridiculous. What are my arms doing? And he's like, well, what do you want them to do? And I'm like, I don't know, but not that. Like, they look ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, so, you don't like, want to be sort of doing tricks sort of like, no. <laughs> no, exactly. So that's why I was in this situation of like, I don't know where to put my arms. They look ridiculous. So I, was, I found myself trying to wear like dark long sleeves so you can't really see them as clear. Do you know what I mean? But I don't know. There's a, definitely a different thing because one you are captured in one very specific moment that has no context to the rest of your move movement other than mm. like the viewer visualizing kind of what journey you would have taken i guess um and also you doing a trick perfectly doesn't necessarily warrant a perfect photo mm. and that sounds like i'm slamming sam which i'm not because there's no one better on a trigger finger mm. than him he's taking mm. it out the clutch at the right mm. time but it's just I don't know. It just doesn't... and for for you, I'd imagine Sam needing to be way more um, acute and definite about his triggering of when to take the photograph, just in mm. terms of your style of skating, mm. um, because it sort of like narrows the moment of the true or best form of the move. Yeah. Uh, you know, because I, I mean, I'd imagine we're not talking about Scott Blackmore sort of sailing down a 50 stair like handrail in a sweat stance where you've got this whole eight, you know, acres of time to sort yeah. of get the form in its right moment. You're sort of more narrow moments of time to get the a form right. Second movements, I guess. Yeah, you're right. So, but he has done a good job. Like I've got a folder here of like little previews that he's given me of what he's got and I'm happy. Um, there's definitely, there's definitely, it's interesting actually, because there's disagreements, like obviously you have it with filmers too, where they're like, nah, that's the one you're like, nah, that's not the one, that's the one. But there's definitely di disagreements with him there as well, where he's like, nah, that's wicked. I'm like, oh, it's not though. We need to go and do it again. I, I yeah, I, I suppose I've, I've kind of grown up shooting photographs mm. and I've been like just blessed and lucky enough to have worked with some of the the, the best guys to sh you know shot photographs really especially yeah. from the UK so it's really interesting um sort of hearing a chap such as yourself maybe not having worked photographically not very not much throughout before yeah and sort of at this stage of your your skating it's um it's definitely a task to capture you I would I'd imagine mm. um, photographically so I'm like really really excited um to see what that like kind of um, portfolio of, of photographs ends up looking mm. like it's also so, interesting to think of tricks that will work for a photo rather than a clip because um, like I said mm. like stuff out of context for a lot, a lot of the tricks that I like to do the, uh, con the context is important so like just coming up with a good idea isn't really 
what I'm trying to do or need to do. It's like an idea that will work. Cause that also puts a massive challenge onto Sam as well. Like, you know, I don't want to make him feel bad by like coming up with an idea that's just not really that photographable. And he's mm. like, I can't make this work. But there was a few that were like that, where like we shot a few angles, shot a few things. And I'm like, mate, I just don't think it's a, a photo. Mm. Like, I'm not even sure if it like, you know, some of them, I'm not even sure if they're actually a clip. So like, they're definitely not a photo, but they're just but that like is your. I, I suppose that is kind of your territory. Uh, I mean, yeah. that's that's that's, it's that's like walking the line of like ridiculousness is like definitely not a trick, and like yeah, that's a really wicked trick idea. Yeah, that's fun. Dis- I mean, that's really fun to to kind of be in that um, state of deliberation with somebody like Sam. I'd guess you know, like what yeah. sort of constitutes uh, you know this is a photograph, or, or maybe it's not. Maybe it's better for Instagram. Maybe it's something that would be store a store an Instagram story. You've got these different yeah, yeah, channels, exactly. these different modalities for for the kind of moves that you'd go out and do. I think like for me, like some of the stuff that I might put on Instagram is more like a sort of um, a spontaneous something or other that has a sort of um, I suppose like a creative maybe outside of the box kind of feel maybe I wouldn't formalize that particular move as a clip for camcorder this is like in the context of Instagram what's happening now we're out playing spontaneity you know street skating and other things happen that isn't meant for the the camcorder this Mm. is meant for the photograph or it's meant for um you know instagram story or it's meant for you know um and i think like uh having concepts having ideas um and agreeing upon some of those things with some of the people around you helps define those pathways of whether you're working on a formal camcorder project with Mm -hmm. you know all of these other inferences and influences coming into it um or you know whether you're sort of going out with one other person to like get photographs and there's there's a couple of more things, you know, I'm, I'm well aware we've been going for quite a while now and it's, <laughs> um, and, you know, I suppose once you sort of break three hours, you're kind of, um, your brain's turning into noodles a little bit. Yeah. Um, and so there's just a couple more bits I would ask you about one, one specific thing and just to sort of almost round off on thinking about some of those really outstanding pieces of work um, under Dirtbox. In 5796, um, you stair-road a sort of historic set of steps um, that I think you posted recently had been used in a Jane Austen adaptation film. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's probably been most likely well known and well trodden for many centuries that that set of steps um, mm-hmm. um the steps they kind of jut out of a wall um sort of almost creating a bit of a, an illusion to them in a way it's sort of an illusion effect did it excite you massively when you saw this spot for the first time and what is appealing about creating an illusion um it was very exciting finding that spot actually we were just walking out it's called the cob in lime regis it's like a i guess it's in like a harbor but it's like a the bit that i'm rolling across a, across the top to then go down the stairs is like this big like stone pier almost but it's like it's curved but at the same time it leans towards the sea and doesn't have any barriers on it at all it's so easy to fall in the sea actually not too long ago a girl in a wheelchair rolled into the sea on it Looking back at it now, like looking at it, it's like such a health and safety nightmare because it's like it's it's quite steep. Well, not like super steep, but it's like definitely, you know, yeah, um, yeah. It's kind of a mad piece of seaside. So that's what it's like on top. Yeah, um, where the and stairs it's all very begin. cobbly. You can see when I'm trying to get the run up. I can't. It's not. It's like running across stones more than it is like rolling across tarmac. Mm-hmm. Um, but on our way out there, because it's quite, it's a little bit of a walk to get out to that bit, there was some stairs that I think I went there purposely for, which are like, they're kind of similar in the way that they come out from that wall, but they're actually full stairs. Right. Because they go both ways like that, there's one going that way, one going that way, and it's painted white on that brick, on that kind of like cobbly wall. It looks sick, and I was like, I'm just going to stair ride down that because it's like, uh, it's just visually appealing more than it is a difficult trick. Mm. And then as we were talking about that, I like looked to the left and was like, 
uh, those are better. <laughs> Let's go over there. So then we saw those ones, and I was like, obviously wondering if possible, but like, it just it wasn't that bad. It wasn't that hard that because of the wall. Like there's obviously a drop to the left, but like mm. I was leaning more towards the wall than I was. They're actually quite skinny, so it was quite difficult to do it. Like kind of like grinding a rail next to the wall without touching the wall. That was the yeah. difficult bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was wicked. And the idea of the illusion was that something that initially spoke to you that they could no, have jutted out the side of the wall. It almost at certain angles you may not yeah. even be able to see that it's a set of stairs if you look yeah. at it sort of straight on no i know what you're saying but that was never really a consideration i don't think i was just too excited about the aesthetic of it, it as like very the idea of the video in general is to be everything at the seaside like it was like a, a yeah seaside the whole bit. edit i guess so the fact that i found these like any time i found a cool spot that was next to the sea it was like yes like it was because there obviously isn't like an endless amount, but like that was perfect because it was so seasidey and difficult and I don't know, just interesting. I didn't learn about the uh, the historic nature of it until way after, but I mean, there must have been a lot of mad stuff that's gone on on those stairs, I reckon. Yeah, it's been a long time they've been there. Looks like they, yeah, it's got um, sort of stories to harbour and and yeah. you know had like a probably a once bustling or thriving whatever infrastructure around it in yeah whatever way it was used before but, but yeah um, it was fairly dangerous there was like gaps like they weren't it wasn't just like step and then yeah. step directly underneath there was some that were like gapped it was very inconsistent which made it hard but does the i mean the the end effect is it, it does look improbable it does look precarious it does look um like you almost sort of you know kind of glide down ghost like kind of yeah. gliding down this this set of stairs because that's kind of what stair riding looks like for the most yeah. part because you know people trip up over stairs like walking up and down mm. stairs you know like you know we're just like <laughs> yeah. kind of you know so there is that kind of you know gliding illusion type effect mm. but just the way that the stairs was were laid out to me in a kind of historical kind of obvious age of them Mm. just um you know communicated some of those sorts of things yeah. to me i just thought it was really 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 cool i mean the illusion was probably down to harry's angle as well i don't think i had much of a discussion of like where it should be filmed from or whatever so he obviously made that decision mm. of he may have that may have been a thought of his when he was filming it i don't know your your understanding of the um terminology of illusion when it comes to tricks is that something that is interesting to you or does that um you know play on your mind how certain people uh, present illusion techniques mm. to say for instance um um looking over one shoulder but then you know sort of spinning kind of into the grind with the other shoulder or mm -hmm. maybe the way in which um colin martin has taken some of his um bodily kind of movements and playing with the sorts of physics of skating creating very illusory kind of effects yeah i mean i do yeah, both of those things, like the illusion, like, well, the, the, the trick that's coined the term illusion, I guess, which is the looking over the other shoulder, isn't it? Um, but I do really like the exploration that Colin Martin's doing with that kind of, you know, the anti-jump, I guess, which is kind of the illusion and things like that, for sure. I do really like the idea of that kind of thing. I've not really explored it, like, massively myself, actually. Mm. Um but I do, yeah, that's definitely a thing that I would explore more. And actually, I think with that kind of thing, you need to be skating a lot. And I'm mm. not skating a lot at the moment. I think you need to be skating a lot at that point in time to really be able to explore. Those are the times when you're like in the like middle of a session where you're just like playing around on something yeah. where you discover those yeah. kind of things, right? And I'm not really doing that at the moment. So I don't think I can explore too much. You like, I can't. I'm not very good at visualizing tricks when I'm just like sat at home. I have to be on my skates doing stuff and I kind of need a spot to tell me what it wants rather than yeah. the other way around. Every now and again, I will have an idea that like I need a specific spot for, but it's more the other way around of like you get to a spot and be like, right, what, what does this need? So the spot can inform a technique that happens by way of how it's laid out. And then you can kind of grow 
that technique and develop it to the optimal sort of yeah, result at that yeah. spot. Yeah. That's, that's really cool. Um, what's your sort of direction with things kind of moving ahead? I mean, you know, we've spoken a lot about the past and I suppose it would be worth saying that you're, you know, very heavily associated with um, muzzle um, and, you know, which is sort of transpired as a sort of transition from dirt box what is your kind of role with muzzle and and you know how do you want to kind of do things like moving forward and is that like a kind of central kind of part of your your sort of skating moving forward mm -hmm. yeah for sure always always going to represent whatever sam's doing for sure the he's the guy um and i don't really like i don't have much say in my, not saying that i want to say like it's muzzle with sam like 100 percent sam like oh you know he's a very close friend so we speak about it a lot yeah. and like i may inform or influence some ideas or like movements within it but like it's 100 percent him it's all him um but we have been discussing lately because the main or one a, a big reason why there's not much skating going on here at the moment is because sam is one man doing a full-time job printing and then also doing muzzle on the side so that's usually his weekends either printing muzzle stuff mm. sewing it making it or spending a whole day posting it out <clears throat> so he's trying to find the balance of because obviously he wants to skate and wants yeah. to like film and make stuff so he's trying and at the moment trying to find the balance of like okay so if i go out and skate more and we make more videos then that means there's going to be less product mm -hmm um and does he want to skate himself yeah of course he loves in terms skating. of no he's incredible yeah like absolutely he's an incredible mm. skater that's obvious from the um seldom seen video footage of him but what there is is like you know he's clearly like really yeah. fucking sick at skating um and would that translate to him being in front of the camera because i know that you're you're sort of in norwich essentially you know not with a million people to skate with yeah yeah um, um so well that so yeah i think he is working towards that he hasn't skated like as i don't know what term to use like as in the same way of like filming and like mm. you know in a way that like i guess competing against himself like trying to make the best stuff he can other than just like skating around the skate parks and stuff so i think it would be a while like he's definitely one of those people where if he's going to be in front of the camera it's got to be his as the best he can be yeah so i think you know it may may be a bit of time of us like skating a bit more before he feels comfortable with that but like for sure i feel like there will be some sam clips at some point um but he's a perfectionist so yeah i mean i can how long that will be i don't <laughs> know I but that also means like i don't know how much he would want me to talk about it i don't know but it would also mean like less product i mean the, the balance there is really difficult i don't know if people yeah. know how much time it takes because he also like when he's doing the printing work on muzzle it's never just like oh just a screen printed t-shirt so, i mean he's always got like techniques that take much longer or like there's a lot more to it so yeah the stuff just doesn't it's not just like one evening a week he's spending on muzzle you know it's like it's a lot of time so yeah, I think it's important to to acknowledge that that it you know takes um, a length of time um, to establish um, like a brand, a platform, you know, soft goods and you know media content that's worth its salt that has integrity, um, you know, both in the objective sense, like when you you know you have a muzzle or a dirt box product, you know, in your hands that you know that the appropriate care and time and expertise has gone into putting this together in terms of like the context of skate companies which we know is kind of hit and miss essentially mm -hmm. you know it's basically get the logo on the thing and put the thing out there and i think you know the kind of care that is taken in the development um research and development if you will yeah. for um the dirt box and muzzle products um exactly. as peripheral products or as like central components to your wardrobe is, is second to none and you know we, we kind of um really benefit from from that so that's that's cool to hear that you know you see that there is um some future kind of there with with muzzle um you know in terms of like the world and the way it is like you you see yourself um 
I suppose, based in in Norwich and coming out of this kind of period of, of coronavirus and mm. and getting back to some some street skating and, and some filming and stuff like yeah, this. Yeah, I'd love to get some street skating. I don't feel like I've uh, um, done Norwich proud yet in terms of use of its areas and spots. So definitely want some of that. Definitely want to film some more. There's some great seaside bits here as well, so that would be good to use. Yeah, I want to come and get that chroma. Yes, get that chroma. <laughs> there's, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of skating to be done here. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a really nice place to be as well. So I definitely am going to be here for a little while longer and hopefully get a lot more skating done here. Yeah, well, look, man, um, I'm definitely going to be uh, looking to, to join up with you um, for sure. Um, come down, get that chroma um mm -hmm. do some seaside shit and um you know look forward to um you know getting back to to some street skating and you know some better times and you know, it's I think so that's... nice to do some street skating even <sighs> some park skating actually i haven't done any skating uh, yeah any any kind of um skating that we that we once did with all of the the kind of optimism and bright ideas that that were, were circulating actually they're still circulating it, it's just um you're so bound by a greater kind of responsibility and and sense of things that it's like oh that was that was then that was like a year it's like a year ago yeah right i mean with that being said you know we did sort of spend most of 2020 like fully fucking shit up um skate wise where where possible but it it just sort of you know fe felt yeah just mm. has been a different kind of feeling of things um but look man um yeah thanks a lot for for sitting to spend fucking hours how long was it how long have we been so far <laughs> oh man it's it's gonna be over three for sure easy Easy, yeah. Oh, it's three o'clock, isn't it? Yeah, it's three o'clock. I mean, it's getting dark, <laughs> and uh, my bladder's bursting again. Are so. you planning to edit it at all? Or is it just going to be one uh, long form? And I think, and I think it, it needs to be edited at all. It's long, think, isn't it? Um, That's long to edit that as well. Um, yeah, and I'm just not about <laughs> that. <laughs> I'm just gonna have the uh, the the bank thing start, and then we're just in, and that. And yeah. I think that's that's what it's got to be, really. I, and I think you know uh i'm new to doing uh podcasting and so if i felt that there were things that we kind of wandered off in an irrelevant kind of direction then maybe but i just don't think i don't think that's the case and so um i, I don't think so but. i think if people are clicking on a podcast that looks over three hours about talking about skiing they're going to know that there's going to be some uh Good shit, man. I mean, Moving. we're going to go in and out. We're going to come back onto ourselves. We're going to go through a bit of a, a journey. And I don't know, it's really fun for, for me um, to do that with people who I respect, whose work that I really admire. Um, and, you know, I mean, we obviously like work together on, on holding weight and other sorts of things more, more closely more recently, but maybe that, that's a conversation for a, a different time. Um, but yeah, I've really enjoyed getting into yeah, it with you, man. And um, we'll probably talk again real soon and um yeah just like appreciate it. look after yourself take it yeah, easy you too man peace dude appreciate it all right all right yeah i mean i'll probably just say goodbye properly right now. <laughs> <laughs> that was the formal goodbye that was the formal